Welcome back, Red Spotters. I'm your host, your Alexis J. Soto, joined by Mr. Peter Martinez, the podcast that brings you all of the latest stories coming out of the world of movies and more. And what a week this is. What a month this is, quite frankly. It has been the journey uh, to see as many films as possible. And today we bring you a review of the latest uh, by Steven Spielberg, and that is his version of West Side Story as well as Aaron Sorkin's latest film that he wrote, of course. He can't help but write every movie. He now in his third directed film, that is Being the Ricardos, based on Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz's time and communism and everything, Um, as well as our reactions to the Spider-Man reactions. Uh, Spider-Man No Way Home opens in theaters this week. By the way, in case anybody cares, so does Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley. <laughs> so there's that out there in the wind. If Talk about a bomb. <laughs> it will be. Um, anything that's not Spider-Man at this point is seemingly destined to be a bomb. So I guess that's where we're at. We'll be discussing where we're at with movies in the box office and you, you, and all of that here on Red Spotlight number 365. Of course, as a reminder, catch our recaps of the Hawkeye series with myself and David Francisco. Uh, the latest episode, we'll be discussing episode 5, which apparently featured a big uh, explosion of some sort. Although, of course... This is recorded out of sequence, so this is episode 365. The episode I am referencing is 364, which has yet to be recorded, so if anybody cared about how we do things around here, but here we are. And yes. Also, uh, apparently Kyle Lira uh, chose to just cancel um, his Disney podcast rather than review Encanto with me, so. He hasn't reached out to you at I'm all, has Not he? even close, No. No. Well, um, curiously enough, uh, Encanto drops on Disney Plus in 10 days. <laughs> it's already going to be a month since it's been in theaters. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I've, I've heard nothing from Fantasy Fair, yeah. which, which is why I can't speak well, to what's going that's on. What I, I just want the record to know that he chose to just close down his podcast rather than have that discussion <laughs> with me. I just want it on the record. Right. Um, wow. Yeah, there's there's that. And um, <laughs> yes, uh, in case anyone was wondering, of course, we are going to go see Spider-Man No Way Home this week. And we will dun, 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 dun. We'll do our very best to get a review on that as soon as possible. Of course, we've been talking at, you know, Alexis length will. about that film. I'll, I'll moderately try. Yeah, basically, that's how these things go. <laughs> Anyway, it has been interesting uh, these last uh, 24 to 48 hours because the world premiere uh, took place in L.A. as well as the initial reactions for Spider-Man No Way Home are out. We've talked about this film for months on end, not just with um, um, our issues with what was in play, but then also, of course, our reaction to the leaks that, by the way, are undisputed and pretty much were from the beginning. But every piece of footage has confirmed and even the reviews themselves have very much confirmed all of the stuff uh, that is going to be featured in this film. So um, the first thing we should note when it comes to reactions, especially with Marvel films and especially with the first round and the first batch and the very first group of people that they invite. And as um, as mean as this is going to sound, again, I mean no ill will toward um, several of these media personalities who are first asked by Marvel Studios to come and take a look at their films for their uh, prized initial tweets. You know, it's become kind of a ritual at this point. Um, but it is rather obvious at this point as well as peter and i have discussed practically for years now then when it comes to the first group of people that are invited by marvel to see their movies these are the people that marvel has identified 
as the ones that will be most favorable to them. And without fail, save two exceptions, uh, that would be Chloe Zhao's Eternals and James Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, which, by the way, we're still pretty positive, which that, I think, in and of itself should tell you how the, yeah. these people can't bring themselves to say anything negative, really, overwhelmingly. Real quick, a, a lot of people like to point out, like, well, Eternals didn't get very good reviews. At first, it did. When yeah. when the first initial reactions were like, wow, it's a lot of movie. There's so much going <laughs> it's so on. Dense. It's so dense. <laughs> they couldn't help themselves to say they didn't like it. They they couldn't they could not just come out and say this was boring crap. They had they had to put that spin on it. So so no, I don't I don't take that because because I've I've noticed that people are saying like yeah, all all the first reviews are are always kiss the ass of, of these films and people are like, well, what about Eternals? You have shit memory then, because I remember those first reviews, and it was all just... They were stopping themselves from saying they didn't like the movie. They're like, I liked it. You know, it's it's a lot. There's stuff. There's not... So, it was that shit. It wasn't until later that the review score started to come down. Um, but those initial reviews, yeah, they were positive. Or, or at least they were they hiding down? to be positive. Because and then regular because reviewers started to, Exactly. To the review. other critics, yeah. the film critics that are not so favorable to these films, mm -hmm. their reviews started uh, being aggregated into the score. And that's why it went down, which I think, mathematically speaking, proves the point that we just made. That it just comes down no matter what. I will say what worries me with these reactions because we're talking about the reaction. Oh no, you probably want to read them first, right? Go ahead. Uh, I wasn't. Uh, or, uh, I mean, I, I. You usually do. Oh, okay. Well, you I, don't I, have I, to, <laughs> but it, that's, um, that's just I. It's a fair assumption on my part. I guess what I'm saying. Oh uh, well, sure. Uh, because there was a, a whole bunch of stuff. Let me go ahead and give people a flavor, a taste, if you will, because so many of them dropped yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. And again, these are people who are most favorable so we have eric goldman first half was a lot of fun but also feels a bit clunky but in the second half it coalesces in a big way and has so much absolutely thrilling wonderful awesome stuff i really love the places it went several uh for several reasons can't wait to see it again mike ryan i wrote about spider-man no way home this feels like a movie that in theory has no business working but does there's a lot going on but it's a whole lot of fun yeah some baked in nostalgia yeah a dash of fan service who yeah. cares the story <laughs> works Eric Anderson, Spider-Man No Way Home, even in a sometimes muddled multiverse, Tom Holland remains a superhero. Uh, Christian Harloff, of course, the beloved Christian Harloff. Uh, I was concerned with so many characters that it would feel crammed and not enough development to care and about what was going on. I'm happy to have been wrong. This is engaging, emotional, and most of all, fun. That word the comes Daily up B. a lot. I know, right? Fun, Gregory fun. Al fun. Gregory Alwood from the playlist said the best of the best part of Spider-Man No Way Home is the return of Defoe and Molina, who are just fantastic. Can't say much more, but the last third of the movie was quite moving. The first third is rough. Gonna make a billion dollars no matter what. <laughs> Clayton Davis, Spider-Man No Way Home has a beginning, middle, and end. I like those three elements. Tom Holland and Zadea are good at making me believe that those are characters. Oh, <laughs> the special boy. Effects look, the special effects look real. I like the fights. I had a lot of fun. This is how I review Marvel movies now. I don't blame him. <laughs> that was interesting. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, and we have here... Uh, Indie Wire. Spider-Man No Way Home. Surprises abound as Peter Parker attempts to understand his spot in the universe in this often thrilling, occasionally muddled sequel. Perry Nemiroff. Uh, Spider-Man No Way Home is a little messy, but the second half soars in that part of the movie. The multiverse is, of it all far exceeded my expectations. Fun, exhilarating often, very emotional, and hugely satisfying 
material. Brandon Katz, while not everything works in No Way Home, what does work is enough for me. It's joyous and serious, messy and ridiculous, yet focused on heartfelt messages that evolve from previous films and trap and excuse me, tap into the central appeal of Spider-Man. Grace Randolph, the beloved Grace Randolph here from our network. Uh, start strong. Our network. Strong. <laughs> She's our network. part of the, the, the Red Spider. No, no. She, she is beloved from the people in our Oh, okay, okay. I'm not saying she's part of us. Okay. But you're that announcing not, something here. That would not work. Oh, no. That'd be a fun thing to see, but it would not be a fun thing to experience. Starts strong, finishes strong, but gets a bit like an SNL sketch in the middle. A fun experience at the movies. Furthermore, she did say it is not a great movie in her review and that it is uh, that Spider-Verse did it better, which, duh. Uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, Forbes, this is Scott Mendelson. I do mourn the straightforward Spider-Man sequel entirely about the ramifications of Peter being outed and framed for murder, but I digress. No Way Home is the very definition of the sum being less than its parts. Much of the long, protracted adventure fantasy is torn between telling a present tense story of the current Peter Parker Spider-Man and reveling in previous established incarnations. The film repeats some of the mistakes of the previous MCU movies, namely in recycling character arcs from previous Spider-Man movies and crafting a plot where the villains aren't connected to Peter and the solution requires outside assistance. For much of its 148-minute runtime, the film walks a fine line between being a sequel to Spider-Man Far From Home and a skewed riff on Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. The comparison isn't a flattering one, as the animated feature didn't rely on the mere idea of universe hopping to provide its jolt. I wish there was more focus on the legal challenges, as sadly the film trades real storytelling for crowd-pleasing Easter eggs, but I do appreciate the film's willingness to draw blood. He finishes... Um, much of the film's second half dives headfirst into remember when conversations and shameless fan bait to the extent that it barely works. It's because the performers are so gee whiz sincere and dorky that the cynical content overcomes its cynical context. Mm -hmm. Moreover, many of the reveals and beats mean at least as much to the characters as to the audience. It's a key distinction that allows the movie to work on its own in story terms, as well as multi-generational nostalgia. Still, it often plays like it, like if into the spider verse cared more about the cameos than about Miles Morales. Is that a good good enough flavor of how the reviews went? Or do you want me to go on? No, I more? think that's good. Okay. Um you know what's worrying to me? This is a big word. <laughs> which which part? Okay. <laughs> well, I, I this part. So as we both know, these films are graded on a curve. I like we've talked about that, right? Unless you're Eternals, <laughs> yeah. Get the, get the <laughs> fuck out of here. Um, <laughs> By the way, we both like that movie. In case anybody's wondering, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, we've talked about that, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm saying for people who haven't listened to those episodes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, in the past, whenever a film. It is even moderately good, and then sometimes even when it isn't, it's declared the best film ever. Uh huh. Uh, Homecoming was declared the best Spider-Man film ever. Far From Home was declared. declared the best Spider-Man film ever. I do not see many people leading with this is the best Spider-Man film ever. I think yeah. maybe one or two. And even then the people who that came from, uh, I died. Let's be honest. Yeah. Not, I don't, at least I don't view them as a, a trusted source on these things. Um, and, and a lot of emphasis on it was messy, but fun. I had a lot of fun. Um, it, and the reason why that's a little bit worrying is because these people are locked and loaded, ready to declare every MCU film they watch as the greatest film ever made, right? Like, they're itching to pull that trigger. So when they don't pull it, 
it's a bit worrisome, right? If they do mm-hmm. pull it, it's like, I'll give it a shot. Let's see. Because even when they do say shit like that, sometimes, even though it may not be bad, I just, it's whatever to me, right? As we've experienced before, I, I experienced it earlier this year with Shang-Chi. I don't hate the film, but it, everyone declared it was the greatest film ever. And I thought it was like, yeah, it's okay. It's fine. Um, so that they, the fact that they're not instantly declaring this, the greatest Spider-Man film by a mile is a bit worried to me. Yeah. Cause if they did that, then I'm like, I'd be annoyed. I'd be like, okay, okay, let's go in. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, other than that, it, this is basically what I assumed the reaction would be. I mean, still, while there were, that last bit was a full-on review by Scott Mendelson by Forbes, that last review, I, which was a full review, mm-hmm. not just a, a Twitter reaction, but clearly he was the most negative of the bunch, because from my perspective... Uh, as what was I think always going to be the case one way or the other unless it was just unspeakably bad I the reaction was overwhelmingly positive sure no one is saying best Spider-Man movie Mm -hmm. but the the passion and the love for this I think not not as a movie but as a Spider-Man experience I think that's the key part here is I think everyone and you saw in those reactions is aware of the fact that the film probably and most likely as they themselves have admitted is clunky, is messy, and kind of all over the place. So perhaps they can't really say best film because of how disorganized it probably comes off as. But as as far as the stuff that's featured in the film, I am getting the impression that... It is the stuff of many Spider-Man fans' dreams, and that in and of itself will be more than enough to carry the film over a lot of the problems that, quite frankly, I'm not so sure are ever really problems, especially for the general audience, at least the problems that we have. But even just structurally speaking, if it's messy, um, that's... That's stuff that people can easily overlook, especially if it has a strong ending, which is what I'm picking up on. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I said this to you, and I had suspected perhaps this could be the case um, into some of these reactions. I mean, reading into some of these reactions about what would happen in the film, and that is a similar situation to what happened with Rogue One. Rogue One, a Star Wars story to this day. By a lot of these same people, by the way, who I just read off, and the same people in these circles, is regarded as the best Star Wars film to have come out of the Disney regime. Full disclosure, Peter and I feel that is complete hogwash, um, mostly because Rogue One is kind of a Frankenstein's monster of a creation because it's it's a Gareth Edwards film that was chopped up and given to Tony Gilroy to rearrange, mix and match to where Kathleen Kennedy can be like somewhat okay with it. And what the finished result is... Um, the best spite... No, sorry, that's my Star Wars <laughs> film ever. Yeah, no. Basically, it's not, it's not as bad as Joss Whedon taking over the Zack Snyder Justice League film. That was just a disaster all around. Yeah. They were able to kind of like save it a little bit with Rogue One, but they were able to save it because they had a strong third act. They had a strong third act that delivered on just beautiful effects, action, set pieces, and most importantly, well, when it comes to Star Wars fan, key cameos of legacy characters that really created an explosion of nostalgia. And that ending... If you end strong, it over delivers mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to general audience. So they, they forget how messy the beginning of it was. And I suspect we're going to go and do the situation with No Way Home. Yeah. No, it's true. Um, uh, if if you have a, a killer first and second act, but that third act really disappoints, people will leave just thinking about how disappointing that third act. But if it's the opposite... They'll leave just thinking about how awesome that third act was, right? Right. Um, and from what a lot of the reviews say, they're like, eh, it's, they, they pull it together in the end. So mm-hmm. I, I agree. It feels very Rogue One in which it's pretty messy. 
It's not um, amazing, but quote unquote fun. <laughs> right. Uh, but it's able to give a, a thrilling third act, which even now, you know, for me, it's like, yeah, I, I really like the third act of Rogue One. Um, it's great. It's great. That th- I think for me, it's like that. That is definitely something worth watching, and it is an act that commands your attention because of the sheer scale. Mm-hmm. I don't think anything else works to the same level as that third act, just as a set piece. Yeah. When I, and I felt that it really did over deliver when it came uh, to that regard. And, uh, and look, but the thing that I that makes me especially worried is that that comparison to Rogue One, at least in my um point of view is not a flattering one because rogue one is not a film i look back particularly too fondly of i love that third act of rogue one i'll put it on and i'll watch that and i'll watch that third act but the rest of the film before the fact doesn't really register with me on any kind of meaningful level and that is going to be interesting, although I think maybe maybe what could happen with No Way Home is the opposite could be the case, where maybe the first 40 minutes are resounding in terms of how they are crafting a, a really deep story here with Peter Parker's identity being revealed. But then, of course, and we've seen the reactions allude to this, that's dropped after the first 40 minutes, and then and, we have all the multiverse shenanigans. And we knew that was going to happen. Yeah, we knew maybe the third first thirty minutes they'll they'll get into it and then drop it for the nostalgia, which again really sucks because I think you could have a killer fucking Spider Man movie mm-hmm. with uh, which that was that was Plan B if the men's were not tied between Sony and Marvel. Tom Holland confirmed the third film would have been a Craven the Hunter film if Sony had um you know parted ways with Marvel Studios. That would have been great. Yeah, I I kind of wish they broke up because fuck. Yeah, that now I do really, really wish that. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know what? Just I guess on the light side, uh, in a few days I'm gonna be going into a theater and watching a Spider-Man film, right? Mm. Yeah. I I I love uh those films as uh. Both me and you know we we recently rewatched the Sam Raimi films. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're they're just perfect to me. <laughs> they're kind of timeless. They they are. I have yet to see three. I'm going to see three mm-hmm. either tonight or tomorrow. I just recently rewatched uh, the first and the second film. And look, th- these are films that we've discussed at length. If you want to dis- uh, go back and discover some of our past work in 2017. Our team went back and did audio commentaries on those films in anticipation to Homecoming coming out in theaters. What a nightmare, yeah. Whew, yeah, that was something. But, um, yeah, those are those are films that, um, man, you just put them on and it's like, wow, these are so, so good, wonderfully made. But it's also the example of um, blockbuster films that are made with definitely uh, – a well-rounded story and character arcs set in mind and every little bit of the film every little thing you see on screen is in service to that and it's in the hands of somebody who has vision for how to visually present this in a way that is interesting the things that immediately caught my eye in terms of editing in both of these films are the beautiful uh transitions Mm-hmm. They're just effortlessly. But then also it's like when you see those transitions, it's, those are choices that make you go like, that is so clever. But it also reminds you, I don't see that anymore when it comes to these kind of movies at all. No, there's no experimentation at all. No. Nah. Like like the, the, the whiz of the camera as it flies back and forth, the pan ins and pan outs. Um, well, everyone knows, you know, about like Sam Raimi cam, the way it he'll he'll zoom in on faces. But yeah, it's also transitions. It's it's hard for me to describe, but whenever I see a film that doesn't feel like a comic book film number two thousand three hundred fifty two, yeah, you know, that just rolled out of the factory, I always say like, I really like this movie. It actually felt like a movie, right? 
Um, mm-hmm. It didn't feel like just another. It, it felt like it was an actual movie. Like someone right. had an idea. <laughs> they had a mm-hmm. story to tell. They the had Eternals a, felt that They way. had an artistic vision behind v- vision. They, they knew that it, they understood that film is a visual medium. So they, they tried right. to be artistic with the way they presented their story. Um, the, the, for sure, Eternals, right? Um, but the, mm-hmm. I think the last one that really, really hit me that way was, uh, the Suicide Squad. Yep. Mm hmm. I was like, oh my God, like this is a, a blockbuster and it actually feels like it's a movie. It doesn't serve yeah. to, it does again. It doesn't feel like another one of these television movies, right? Right. That and, and and I was thinking about how we talk about the MCU is graded on a curve, and I think the reason it's graded on a curve is because like when you re- review a specific episode of television, a lot right. of what goes into reviewing that episode is everything that's come before, mm-hmm. and everything that you assume will happen in the future, right? And, right. and each episode is basically a bridge between what's happened before towards what's going to happen next um and that's what it feels like so many of these movies they they don't feel like singular stories they feel like transitions to the next transition Mm -hmm. right and and we're constantly just moving and never taking a time to just tell a story but with like the suicide squad it's like oh like this is a movie it's not trying to hint at some greater story it will eventually tell this is it. This is the story. We're watching it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I I love that shit. I really do. Um, I, I, my ultimate point when I brought up the Sam Raimi films, how we saw them, is I love Spider Man as a character. Yeah, I think he's just fucking great. And you know, at, at this point, I, I I feel like I just love the character so much. It's it's kind of like cold pizza. You know the phrase about cold pizza? Mm-hmm. It's still pizza. It's still pizza. <laughs> <laughs> um so I'm I'm going in with an open mind, but uh I I think we've been fairly accurate on how we've assessed this film from the beginning. Yep. Um but like all times, I'm going in with an open mind mm-hmm. and an eye towards having fun. Because oh yeah, I the worst thing in the world is having a bad movie experience. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want I want to love it. So fingers crossed. Yeah, with me, um, it it's gonna be look. I, I just look forward to a a fun time. I know it's gonna deliver on. It being a great spectacle and great fun, as the reactions have said, for the first night. I have no such delusions at this point. Actually, maybe that that may be going a bit too far. I have no expectation at the moment. Again, we'll see how good I actually feel about it when I see it. But I have no expectation, really, in the long run, the film is going to really make some any kind of impact on me. Only because of ba- I basically know the whole movie. I've known the whole movie for a while now. Granted, while there were some stuff that I read recently that made me feel more optimistic about the film and made me feel like, okay, this may not be entirely throwaway. Um, I just like with me, this is. I think I have to just fall back on. We're talking about these reactions, right? And let's look at how the Marvel stuff is. You're so right when you say that all the films are graded on a curve as if they were TV. And while there is so much bitching and whining about the fact that the MCU is far too formulaic and how every single movie feels the same, and they're right when they say that because we've been saying that... um, like an episode of television, when there is one that deviates entirely from the story um, and tries to do something different, you know, creatively speaking, narratives, narrative-wise, it seems to, no matter what, get the ire of people because they feel as if their time was wasted in this overall through-line um, 
it, as that would happen in a TV show. I can give you a Marvel. I can give you actually several Marvel examples of Marvel TV shows. Look at what happened with episode three of Loki. Mm-hmm. When when you know Loki and Sylvie were just out on that planet, you know, having character, you know, motivated conversations. Look at how the response was like to the first two episodes of WandaVision. Anytime they try and do something creative, anytime they try to do something different, it is treated as, well, you're just wasting my time here. And what's really hypocritical is when it comes to some of these people, they're also the ones that are saying, Marvel, give me something new and interesting. Now, with Black Widow... The reactions were overwhelmingly positive. No one was saying it was the best Marvel movie ever, but all the reactions were positive. Black Widow... I mean, you can't get more throwaway and disappointing than Black Widow. That's how I personally felt about it. Yeah. Whereas these people were praising it for how emotional it was, how great it was for Natasha, and I really... Couldn't disagree. The Hawkeye series has provided more closure to that character than Black Widow's own movie. That alone should tell you how much of a useless waste of space it is. Shang-Chi. Whoa, were those reactions very enthusiastic. And I maintain that tells you low-key Black Widow shit the bed so badly that expectations were very, very low. And so what Shang-Chi was able to be competent... Um, and actually quite good for a couple of sequences. People were over the moon with that film. I saw it, and I had a lot of fun. And then my mind completely deleted that experience. And when I went back to go see it, I couldn't get through it. So ultimately, that film is kind of really nothing, unfortunately to me. Whereas everyone will tell you Shang-Chi is the best comic book movie of the year. That doesn't compute whatsoever, but there's that. And then comes the case with Eternals. Very, uh, the first reactions, still positive, but definitely there was, if you read between the lines, there was a tinge of reservation as well as muddled disappointment and then also general confusion. I think with Eternals, as you said, Peter, maybe in our other reviews, that was definitely the case when that felt the least like another episode in this long-running TV series that is the MCU. And and, and I'm not even sure if many people, many of the critics, unfortunately, even realized this themselves, but perhaps that definitely played a role into how they measured um, the film, and that's sad, but I, again, speaking for me personally, the overall consensus with that film uh, was definitely on the mixed side, and some people especially really just kind of like were whatever on it, whereas with me, uh, it came out really high on it at the end of the day. So it's like the the trend has been when it comes to the consensus and the early reactions, whichever way, when Marvel movies are concerned, mm-hmm. when they're when they're, when they're going one way, as far as this year is concerned, I've always gone in the other direction. <laughs> and I, if I'm using that as an indication, well, I think that should tell you where I should expect I'm going to be pointed at when mm-hmm. I see this movie. I feel that's a fair assessment, but... Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, people have different tastes, right? People have different um, <laughs> uh, likes and dislikes and what they look for in movies, and that's perfectly fine. But I think we can definitely, you know, gauge a collection of opinions by the same group of people where you can discern which way you're going to go when it actually comes out. So, but we're going to see it and uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, Um, real quick. So uh, awards season is starting and there isn't too much to say, quite frankly, on this. But, you know, uh, the Critics' Choice Awards are one of the key um precursors uh to the oscars and they have already come out with their nominations and there were quite a few of them let me just go over uh best picture what they have right now right so for best picture the nominees were belfast coda don't look up dune king richard 
Licorice Pizza, Nightmare Alley, The Power of the Dog, Tick Tick Boom, and West Side Story. I'll start off with the ones that I don't really know too much about. Coda, I don't know what that is. That I don't seemingly know either. Came out, <laughs> that seemingly came out of nowhere. That wasn't on my on my radar. Um. I have not seen Nightmare Alley because it's opening in theaters this week. That's your second reminder if you want to go support Guillermo del Toro's um, new film out in theaters this week. Um, but a lot of the other ones definitely were films that were gaining traction and were, you know, in oh the talks. Oh, my God. Do you want me to read what you is- the, uh, the, the synopsis for Coda? Oh. Oh, God. What is it? It's, uh, listen to this. As a Coda child of deaf adults ruby is the only hearing person in her deaf family when the family's fishing business is threatened ruby finds herself torn between pursuing her love of music and her fear of abandoning her parents okay sounds very oscars it sounds very depressing um, which is fine, which is fine. Um, I'm sure it's good. Um, on some level, these films are good. So, um, Don't Look Up, we'll start off with that one. I'm not going to watch that movie. And here is why. I really didn't like... Adam McKay is like Aaron Sorkin, where if you like his work, you're you're almost always going to like his work. But if you don't like his work... You probably never will because they kind of always do a variation of the same thing. With um, Adam McKay, he has a flair. He has a style that I, quite frankly, don't care for. I really, really disliked The Big Short. So much so that I ignored Vice all entirely. And knowing what Don't Look Up is all about, it probably would make me want to kill myself. I'm so glad you said it because I was about to say that. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't will need avoid this. this like the play. I don't need, I don't this, need in this in my life. Yeah, same, same. I don't need it. I, I don't have... want it. <laughs> no, I don't expect it. I, I don't accept it. I just, I don't. Um, and, and it's fine that people like it, right? Maybe some people will find some enjoyment out of this, but I can't. It is just. I can't, and I won't. <laughs> it, it's just. It's hard to satire what already exists and what already is real life, you know? I, I'll i take it a step further. It's not for me. I already know all these things. Yeah. Sorry. I know the world's stupid and climate change and all that. Um. Yeah. This is for you people that don't know out there. But I know. Yeah. And I don't want to. I, yeah, I don't need it in my life. I don't need it, so I'm not. I'm not watching. I'm not touching that at all. Mm-hmm. I'm. I'm just not. Uh, as far as the other films are concerned, I have seen Dune. Of course, we've reviewed it. Very well deserved. Very happy to see that. King Richard is such a frustrating thing for me because I, I thought it was a terrific movie, and I think it's exactly the kind of film that these kind of groups la- gravitate toward. I just feel that the protagonist is so deeply problematic and the fact that no one's bringing attention to that. All the while, of course, there are currently hit pieces on Licorice Pizza, West Side Story, uh, Encanto, whereas no one's touching King Richard. Yeah, which is so weird, you think? Because there's there's a certain um, group of people that survive on creating controversies to create clicks, especially in films. Like that's that's if they don't create a controversy on the next f- big film, then they don't eat. Mm-hmm. If, if they're if one doesn't exist, they will make sure one exists. So yeah, I'm surprised. Maybe if we get closer, if it seems like um, Will Smith is front runner or something, maybe mm-hmm. you'll finally see someone say like, "Why are we celebrating this?" <laughs> that always happens. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe that's what it is. Uh, I have seen Licorice Pizza, and it is sensational. Uh, it is opening everywhere on Christmas, so I expect Peter and I will go back and see that. Um, 
Power of the Dog, we talked about it last week on Netflix. It is a film that is excellent on a technical standpoint uh, as far as direction and it has a brilliant twist in there. It's not a character-driven piece. It's also not a performance-driven piece that I'm all that crazy about. So personally speaking, I'm kind of ambivalent toward this movie. You're the... And yet... Yeah. You're the second person that's told me that. Like, it's a good film. I feel whatever about it. Oh, well, I'm proud to be the second. No, no, no. Um, you, when I... you were the first, but then I'm saying a second person told me that. I'm just letting oh, you know okay. you're not alone. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But the performances are great. It it looks beautiful. And I think that's about I can say about the movie. Uh, great score. Great score. But best picture... Personally, I, I, I find it kind of strange how this kind of really has any kind of passion behind the movie. I really don't get it personally, but okay. Tick, Tick, Boom, uh, the first feature by Lin-Manuel Miranda, uh, stars Andrew Garfield. Mm. Um, it's very, very good. I saw it the other week, and I've been kind of obsessed with the music. Um, of course, it's a musical. But you hated um, the music I'm, in Encanto. I didn't hate it. I said it was whatever. I also said I'll watch it when it comes on Disney Plus again, and I'll reevaluate my assessment. Um, because I do leave the door open to change my mind. Um, Flip flops. Well, sure. Um, if that's what you want to call it. But with Tick Tick Boom, I, I it's 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 got a great story, and also it's got tragedy behind it with uh, the main uh, character. So. I'm curious to see if this ultimately gets in Best Picture, but it's a very, very, very good film. Um, I w I do plan to see Belfast soon, so we'll see how I feel about that one. That is by Kenneth Branagh. And then there is West Side Story, which we will talk about more at length in today's episode. And then just real quick, as far as um, director is concerned... Um, Oh, by the way, uh, these are a good indication for what your Best Picture nominees will be. So there is that. Best Director um, by what the Critics' Choice nominated. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson for Licorice Pizza. Kenneth Branagh for Belfast. Jane Campion for The Power of the Dog. Guillermo del Toro for Nightmare Alley. Steven Spielberg for West Side Story. And Denny Villeneuve for Dune. That's quite the competition we got there. That's six directors. Five of those six are going to be your Best Director nominees. Um... So we'll see which one gets left out when that happens. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, there, I could say more, but there really isn't all that. They're the Critics' Choice nominees. We'll go more in depth when we get the Oscars or maybe actual winners. But that's where we're at right now. Do any of these movies catch your uh, interest? The ones you've already seen, Dune. You've already seen West Side Story. Um, the ones that have, that we were discussing, Tick, Tick, Boom, The Power of the Dog, Nightmare Alley, which we will see at some point, and as well as Licorice Pizza. Um, of course, we already eliminated <laughs> Don't Look Up, no, so we're movie. not doing that. Or And then also Belfast and Coda. Um, Coda looks like a Hallmark movie to me. <laughs> uh, but it's getting good reviews, so maybe I'll like it. I don't know. I like good, happy stories sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely want to see licorice pizza. Definitely want to see, um, something alley. Uh, what the fuck? <laughs> Nightmare right. alley. Nightmare alley. Yeah. Uh, what else? Tick tick boom. Uh, I'll watch it. Uh, it, Lynn didn't write this music. If that makes you feel, oh better. no wonder you love it. What else? Um, <laughs> what was the other ones you said? Oh, uh. The dog. I curiosity has gotten to me with that film, The Power of the Dog. Yeah, so I'll, I'll definitely watch it just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. And is that it? Basically, yeah. that's where we're at. There are other there are other films that could sneak in there. Let me quickly go through some interesting nominees. Or, um, not the whole list, just very quickly some that, I, that caught my attention. Remember that trailer we saw for the tragedy of Macbeth? Yes. Uh, Denzel Washington got a Best Actor nomination here, um, as well as Peter Dinklage for that musical Serrano. That's so funny. Uh, we we went to San Diego to see the film. Uh huh. Every trailer was a new film we'd never gotten a trailer for. 
Yeah. Of course, the one that we're all excited for is Marry Me with Jennifer Lopez and Owen Wilson coming <laughs> uh, uh, Valentine's Day 2022. The hottest film of uh, 2004. I love it. I love it. <laughs> That's going to be so much fun oh, uh, to cover. That was that was I was I've seen that trailer already three or four times when I'm in a, in a movie. It's like it's it's hilarious every time. What's so funny is it's literally the same actors they would have from that era too. Right? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's so funny. Uh, Alana Heim for Licorice Pizza, Lady Gaga for House of Gucci. That's she. She was great in the film. Even if she wasn't, wasn't great. let's not pretend like she wouldn't be still nominated. Base, yeah. So Nicole Kidman got in for being the Ricardos, as well as Kristen Stewart for Spencer. At the moment, that category is between Kristen and Nicole, the way I see it and what I've been hearing. But that could always change. Um, Jared Leto got in for Best Supporting Actor for House of Gucci. <laughs> of course, I'm not sure how big of a surprise that is, but... It's there. J.K. Simmons got in for uh, being in the Ricardos. Oh. Um, interestingly enough, Jamie Dornan for Belfast, not, unfortunately, Barb and Star Vest, and go to Vista Del Mar, which is a tragedy in and of itself. Uh, Best Supporting Actress, uh, Ariana DeBose, who played Anita in West Side Story, and then also the original Anita, Rita Moreno, got in for West Side Story. Of course. Kirsten Dunst got in for The Power of the Dog, and she is quite good in that film. Um. Yeah, a young actor, actress, Rachel Zegler from West Side Story got in, and Cooper Hoffman uh, got in for Licorice Pizza, who is the son of uh, what's his name? Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who passed away. Uh, way and too what soon. was he in? Licorice Pizza. He's the lead. Oh wait, Alana. Oh, Hine. oh, he. Either the, that's him. He, yeah, okay. yeah. I didn't know when I saw the film, but it's like, whoa. Okay. Okay. He's good. He's very good. Is he good? Okay. Yeah. Nepotism. Absolutely. Isn't it delicious? Oh, you gotta love it. You gotta love it. Original screenplay, Licorice Pizza, King Richard. Oh, David Sirota. Uh good for him getting a nomination. Um for Don't Look Up, even though I will avoid the film like the plague. Aaron Sorkin always gets in this uh for the screenplay um category for being the Ricardos. Um a lot of stuff for Dune, West Side Story, and the technical categories. I thought this was funny. Uh, best costume design and best hair and makeup. Cruella uh, made an appearance. Um, yeah. Also, the Golden Globes nominated Emma Stone for best, uh, I think, uh, Actress comedy actors. in a comedy yeah. or musical. musical. Which it is neither, but okay. <laughs> That's that film is insane, isn't it? I it's I, such a weird fucking movie. I, I, <laughs> it's an anomaly. It's so weird. Um, best visual effects, I think, and I noticed this with uh, Critics' Choice, and maybe another one. The fact that Shang Chi is in visual effects, really, but what also isn't Eternals. Which was far more visually beautiful. They don't watch Shang the films. I know, and the only reason why it was because Shang Chi was more popular than Eternals. Let's be real about that. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, they have a best comedy category. Barb and Star got in. So did Free Guy, and I like both of those movies a lot. So good for them. Um, and yeah. So that's it. All right. That was a long list for just the best picture ones. I know. I know. I, but we got through it as quickly I know. as we could. You can't resist. So let's go ahead and get into um, what we did this past weekend. So we, oh, we back in this. back in 2017, we're going back a few years now. Uh, Peter and Kyle paid me a visit uh, in San Diego, and we went to the Reading Cinemas that is located in the Claremont area. Uh, to see two films that were not playing um, in the Valley. So the two films that we saw were the Best Picture winning, The Shape of Water by Guillermo del Toro, and The Post by Steven Spielberg. Uh, it was a double feature. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we love our double features. And that especially 
was uh, one of the best times I think we've ever done uh, as far as like just having a whole day dedicated to movies. Um, and, you know, especially the kind of movies they were. Um, the kind of movies that we had to like, well, you guys had to venture out to go and see. And both were quite good. Um, so this time around, a few years later, um, I had figured, you know what, let's go ahead and make a day out of it. We were already planning on watching West Side Story, which was available in our theater. Um, but we also wanted to see Being the Ricardos for several reasons. Uh, both Peter and I are fans of the I Love Lucy sitcom, as well as fans of um, Aaron Sorkin's work. Now, granted, we also dunk on him, but you know his work is always highly entertaining. And so if he's doing a movie, he always seems to captivate our attention no matter what he's doing. So that definitely played a role in all of this. So what we arranged was we went back and visited reading uh, cinemas because they were one of the few locations that were playing the film. It opened wide this past week, but in select theaters. And then, of course, on the 21st, it will be available on Amazon Prime because it is an Amazon film. So we saw Being the Ricardos, and we saw West Side Story. Interestingly enough, when it came to visiting reading cinemas back in 2017 and then also this year in 2021, both of those occasions involved a Steven Spielberg film. Yep. Both bombed. Also, eerily, it's like if we, if we, if we had timed it a little bit better, we could have also caught Nightmare Alley there. Yeah. And that would have been a, re- a repeat of Del Toro and Spielberg. That's true. So, Mm -hmm. interesting timing for all of that. So, shall we go ahead and get into... I'm going to ask, of course, that Peter get out his phone and we go to Letterboxd, um, you know, the place for all things movies. No, uh, yes, of course. Of course. I'm glad you admit it. Being the Ricardo. And select limited series. Directed by Aaron Sorkin. Directed and written by Aaron Sorkin follows Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz as they face a crisis that could end their careers and another that could end their marriage. Starring Nicole Kidman as Lucille Ball, Javier Bardem as Desi Arnaz, J.K. Simmons as William Frawley, and Nina Arianda as Vivian Vance. So... We also have other cast members. Uh, yeah, but I didn't mention. mention. We should. Uh, we have. You the just want to mention Tony, a certain someone. Tony Hale. Okay. Tony sure, Hale, sure. who was great. I didn't realize it, but there was a wonderful Arrested Development reunion in this movie. In what way? I know, I know. Yes, I do. Okay, Maybe. you were like. <laughs> okay that's why i was asking you to read out the rest of the cast that way people would know who would be in the movie um It'll be a oh you said maybe for them yeah did you said, say maybe yes, maybe oh well, I, that maybe. went over my head <laughs> that went over my head entirely yeah. excuse me um but yeah anyway it was interesting what do we expect out of this film honestly i i didn't really know what to expect all i knew about it was that i was very interested because i really did in you know i did grow up on watching the sitcom Mm -hmm. um primarily because it was um on at the time that my mom was watching it she herself also grew up with the sitcom because of course it had long since been off the air when she grew up with it so we had also had discussions previously um, in other podcasts that Peter and I both feel that more than any other TV show in the history of the medium, I Love Lucy has remained the face of television. And genuinely, a lot of the stuff that that we do know about that went down um, from just stuff that we've picked up on from being, you know, fans of the show uh, was historic, also crazy and funny and so the fact uh, that Aaron Sorkin picked this as his next film 
was first of all exciting because we knew we were going to have some you know long uh long walk down hallways and you know sharp witted fast paced delivered dialogue and of course Sorkin delivered on that okay. tenfold as he usually does a lead character who's basically a genius and talks kind the of. same to everyone <laughs> As every ever other lead in every other one of his projects. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's definitely that there. There was what I think interested me more that Aaron picked this movie was because it was, at least on the surface, uh, with one exception, a deviation from what he does. At least as far as the orientation of this uh, uh, or the genre, right? A lot of the stuff that he has worked with in the past is deeply rooted in overt politics, right? Um, you know, or overt political events, shall we say, like with last year's The Trial of Chicago 7. He, of course, wrote The Newsroom and many others. There was Molly's game. Right, right. So it, it hasn't been exclusively that, but it's been mostly that. Molly's game being one of those exceptions and now being the Ricardos. So... Also, it was interesting with the people that they announced as the cast. I accepted J.K. Simmons immediately. Nicole Kidman and Javier Bardem, I mean when they announced, not as far as like at this point watching the movie, when it was announced mm-hmm. that they were cast as the, the characters, that was a bit of an interesting choice and one that I think a lot of people are not going to buy just flat out. Yeah. Um. Because, you know, appearances and such. So, I thought this film was very, very good. And like I have done with Encanto, I am going to preemptively um, delay my final word on this film until I see it again on Amazon Prime. Because I'm not sure how to feel about it all that well in in the vein of how much I actually do love this film for this film. But again, without me being too sure that I loved it, it immediately became one of my favorite films of the year. It is highly entertaining. It is highly engaging. And of course, it features amazing dialogue (laughs) that is quite frankly funny, as well as great performances, particularly by Nicole Kidman. Uh, If you are a fan of Lucille Ball, if you're a fan of just this era uh, of the legacy of I Love Lucy, this is kind of a must watch. Um, I'm very curious. No, I'm very curious to hear what you think of the format in terms of like the, the format in... So we start off the film, and off the bat, I'm a little bit thrown off because it feels as if we're being introduced to this movie as if it were a documentary. Mm-hmm. And we have several people or characters from the, who worked on the show who we see you know, in younger iterations in the flashbacks. Um, and they start off talking about the events of this one week – and off the bat, I'm like, okay, so are they going for like a documentary or mockumentary style kind of thing? We have a lot of flashbacks and flash forwards to kind of bring a lot of needed context into the relationship of Lucy and Ricky. I mean, sorry, not Ricky, uh, Desi. Desi, Desi and, and, and Lucy, as well as who she is, where she came from, and how she struggled in her career. So to me, what was interesting about it is that it kind of, the flashback sequences felt very much like they were by the book biopic material. Mm -hmm. And then the stuff that we got with the the documentary um, sequences, but mostly with the, the time that we're actually in, in, uh, this long week in when the show is airing and they're taping, I believe the ending of season two or whatever that felt very much not like you would from what you would expect from a typical biopic. So it's, it's kind of a mix and match and that's not, 
precisely the movie I was expecting, but that's not a bad thing because I feel just because of that reality, it does, I think, set it apart from other kind of movies that would go very much by the book as they start the film and the beginning of this person's life and we go all the way to the end and then that's the movie. Much like Respect did earlier this year with the life of Aretha Franklin. So I was not expecting it, but overall I did really enjoy um, that particular, I guess, approach to telling the story. Um, Sorkin is very good at crafting these scenes yeah. left and right. And he's also, I think gotten better at tampering some of his worst tendencies in certain instances. And he really knows how to, what I think, you know what the ending to the trial of Chicago seven and the end in, in the ending to this film, if you compare them side by side, I feel like maybe he did learn from that because I feel like he was going for this big, grand, swelling, emotional finale with Trial of Chicago 7. And I think it backfired completely, where I think I was just openly laughing because of how, like, big they were going for with the ending of Chicago 7. Whereas with the ending of Ricardo's, I definitely felt the suspense and the tension and the excitement and just the the actual, like... The emotion that I feel like he was going for in that scene, he actually succeeded in capturing and making you feel. Whereas in Chicago 7, it kind of went off the rails in a, in the worst way possible. So, yeah. This was great. <laughs> um, it is... It's Aaron Sorkin. You know what I mean? Like, it's Aaron Sorkin through and through. It's the... <laughs> going ons of behind the scenes television and all the trials and tribulations and love and uh, breaking up and all that good stuff uh, rolled into one trying to wrangle the higher ups you know trying to plug one leak and then another one pops up over here and the witty dialogue back and forth and back and forth and back and forth everyone's as witty as witty can be Um, but I'll say this I feel like uh, film fans and movie reviewers are kind of tired of the shtick of um oh my god of Aaron Sorkin and I feel as if that's not entirely fair of these people still lose their shit for every uh Wes Anderson film it, it, they shouldn't be, I, I I don't know, I feel like it's kind of hypocritical then to come and be like, eh, it's, it's just more of Aaron Sorkin doing Aaron Sorkin Or shit. every Paul Thomas Anderson film, yeah, or yeah. every Guillermo del Toro film, mm. or every Martin Scorsese film, or, you know, fill in the blank. Yeah, I, um, I really enjoyed this one. I, I really mm-hmm. did. Um... Uh, uh, I was laughing quite a bit. The, oh yeah, it's again. It's an Aaron Sorkin script. It's 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 good. It's very good. Uh, I agree. I think his directing is getting better. I I definitely see clear steps in the right direction from Molly's Game to um, Trial of Chicago Seven to. I'm still here, by the way. Continue. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, to um, this one being the Ricardos. I was not crazy about the casting um, initially after having seen it. It's pretty good. What's difficult is with Lucy, and, and this is both the upside and the downside to having, again, Aaron Sorkin write the script, is that I feel like every one of his female, not even female, just like lead characters is the same. There's sort of this like witty, no nonsense person that's sort of smarter than everyone in the room and makes them know it, right? Uh huh. And <laughs> that's every other Aaron Sorkin lead character ever. And that's kind of what Lucy is. So it's like, okay. Uh, but I, I did really like um, Desi Arnaz in this film. Mm-hmm. I thought that one was, was a real standout. You mean Javier Bardem as Desi Arnaz? Well, yeah, I mean the character Desi Arnaz. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I thought that was... Oh, yeah. 
he, he was really interesting and and yeah Javier Bardem actually did a, a lot better job than I had initially thought he really did a pretty good job of transforming um by the end of the film I believed the the performance yes yes uh, even though I don't think either of them look that much like their counterparts. No. Uh, I, man, I don't want to sound sexist when I say this, but what's her name kind of looked scary in this film. <laughs> Wait, uh, you, Nicole Kidman? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which part um, did she look scary to you? Just the whole movie. <laughs> oh my god. I, I don't know if they put, like, makeup or prosthetics to try to make her look like Lucille Ball. Perhaps they did. But it, it just kind of looked a little... She didn't look... She doesn't... She didn't look like herself. She clear... There's clearly something going on. Right. Because you look at a picture of um her during... I, I saw uh, how she looked during the uh, press tour. And it's like, well, uh -huh. yeah, that's Nicole Kidman. So right. they, they clearly did something to her face to try and make it look more like Lucille Ball, but it came off more unsettling to me I, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> um i was just laughing at uh because i guess it's kind of been made into a meme now when she's um when she's in the lucy ricardo makeup um and there's the scene in the table where she kind of freezes and she has this blank stare um toward the end of the film yes 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 uh, that's the one that kind of like made me laugh, but for the most part, I accepted it. Quite frankly, I'm not. I'm not sure I was unsettled, but I, I really was captivated by her performance. I think Nicole Kidman did an amazing job as far as capturing the voice, especially they, they, that her her imitating the voice made yeah made the it voice feel a lot like it was mm -hmm. was great. Yeah, yeah, and that was part I believed it the most. Um, and again, not to take spotlight away from her, but I, her, I think her Pierre Bardem kind of put on a voice too. I didn't expect that yeah. from him. Because no. Javier Bardem has a much deeper voice, but uh, what's his name doesn't? Desi Arnaz. Right. And I higher. saw him. It's a little higher. The accent's a little different. Um, I, 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 I thought I was just going to feel like I was looking at Javier Bardem, and it's very much Javier Bardem. But mm -hmm. uh, through the performance, there's more. It's like, okay, this. I, I don't feel like I'm just looking at this actor, which is good. Um, of course, everyone else was fucking great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, overall, I, I I dug the story. I dug it, it, the heart of the the sh the film is the relationship between the very complicated relationship between Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, and mm -hmm. all that stuff. I felt was strong, and I thought it was well done. Right? There mm -hmm. is still a, a few Sorkinisms throughout the movie that just kind of makes you go like, Ugh. there he goes again. But right. um, uh, like like the whole thing with this is a classic thing he does where he'll set it up where it's like someone is calling finally calling out one of the characters for being an asshole and they get into a shouting match and then at the very end the the one being called out for being an asshole kind of let slip that what they were doing was not as assholeish as might originally might seem right mm. that's that's a classic sorkinism thing Move. that goes on and I remember that very clearly when the discussion with the, uh, what's her, Ethel. Or right, the, Vivian, I, Vivian Vance. Vivian Vance, right. And, and and they basically turned Lucille Ball being a bitch to her and, and trying to make her look less attractive and, and stuff and, and turn it into, well, actually she did that because she wanted better female representation. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a woman on screen that looks like every woman. Um, which, again, I know nothing about the history, but I, that feels like a bullshit move to me. <laughs> right, right. That that made me think, like, well, is that the real reason? Um, what the... Uh, it's interesting because, like, the, the film is called Being the Ricardos, of course, but, like, it's... it's a lot of that, the stuff as far as, you know, I Love Lucy, the characters, is kind of on the on the background of things. It's really more about like, you know, if you want to know how the show was made, but then also um, the process, mm -hmm. especially by Lucille Ball and how much um, of a creative force she really was. Both her and her husband, Desi were on the show. Um, you really can't, I think 
over exaggerate how much involved they were. I do. It was interesting to see how I guess Sorkin envisioned how Lucille Ball um, interpreted, or at least how he interprets how her how her process was for figuring out her her comedic genius. She's, right, because there's Sherlock, the Sherlock Holmes of comedy. <laughs> That definitely felt like that, right? So when you know she's in a, in a writer's room, or a lot of the films, you know, she's going to have a back and forth with some of her, you know, her writers, and she's thinking about like what they can do to make uh, the scene work better that, that they're thinking about, and we see the process in her head, right? Like we see her kind of like visualize a whole scene as if she were there. One of the moments is the infamous um, grape sequence where she's stomping on the grapes, but that's obviously from a future installment of the series, I Love Lucy. And at the time, uh, this is right before they go into the storyline where she gets pregnant Mm -hmm. uh, with little Ricky and everything on the show. And that was interesting. Um, It was interesting to see all the... Because a lot of the film also happens to be... um, She can't get over... This one, uh, I guess the the dressing of it or the uh, arrangement of this table uh, in the opening of one episode that they're filming. Again, this happens to uh, the, the main story happens throughout the course of the week. And they do a good job of like, I guess, like making you feel like, well, you know, she's she ultimately is working toward a better um, scene here. But at the same time, if you were there in person, which at times the film really does a good job of making you feel like you were there, you would be so irritated and annoyed because of how often she feels like she has to re, um, redo the exact same sequence or the rest of um, the people involved are quite frankly tired and want to move on to do the rest of their jobs. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was... But of course, I think ultimately that part of... I think it's kind of said I think this is the subtext that the reason for why Lucy or Lucille was so hung up on that particular opening sequence not just because of like she wanted to make the situation in in the show better but I I think seemingly it also serves because we end the film with that I think having you know been acted it's seen, but we also end the film in a different, in a different way with um, seemingly the beginning of the end of her marriage to Desi, and I felt like what the film was trying to say is that because when she seemingly walks away from Desi at the end of the film, once a bombshell is dropped, the scene is worked on, or I guess they they say that I guess she just moved on and gave up on it. She forgot, and that the... was it. I well, sure. Well, I think to me. Her hyper focusing on that scene, trying to make it perfect, was her was her way of sort of uh, trying to work on her marriage, right? Yes, and, and trying yeah, to make that's what it I was trying to say perfect and trying to make it mm-hmm. work, right? And her just sort of dropping the scene and moving on from it is very much metaphor for her marriage, dropping the marriage and 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 moving on from it, right? That's why, like, that's the last thing they live, leave you with. Oh, I guess we're doing spoilers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's the last thing they leave you with before, the, the you know, the, some title cards come up and say, like, yep, she divorced his ass. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, to, to me, it's very clear that's what that all was about. Um, but it's well done. It's it's really well done, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, a lot of it happens here is, like, as far as the story of what happens... In this one week, Lucy's working on this scene, which really is she's working on her, trying to save her marriage. Also, the show is in jeopardy because her past voter registration comes up and the press is basically and Congress is basically threatening to destroy her career because at one point she registered as a communist. Yeah. And of course, in the 1950s, that's worse than being a fascist. By far. In America. So... <laughs> better if you're not aware yeah the, the, the hollywood tan the blacklisted um members actors that you know uh identified as 
communists, which I'm sure a lot of people who know and love I Love Lucy do not know that about Lucille Ball. In large part because of how good of a job they did covering that shit up. Yeah. Ooh, she never went back. Of of course, right? Especially at the time. Yeah. You're not going to... It's not something you're going to come out and talk about. Oh, hell no. No. In fact, the actual... You, you see a lot of the process uh, it, behind that thinking play out in real time in the film. As to like, you know, you have the, the, the executives and the higher ups and the owner of all the production companies come in and like have like a powwow about like, okay, what are we going to do? Because this is bad. This is the height of the Red Scare. You know, there's McCarthyism. If this comes out, our show will be dropped. Like that's that that that, that, that that's real cancel culture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Literally, that was what the would real happen. Cancel culture, yes. Yeah, you like you were done. Mm-hmm. And so they have to come up with ways to get around it. All the while, of course, the tabloids are writing all these salacious headlines about. Lucille Ball's actual marriage to Desi Arnaz and that falling apart. So it's just kind of like a a perfect storm of things happening at the same time. She is getting in creative arguments with her writers, with her staff. Of course, there's also there's the butting of heads with um, Vivian Vance here and all the issues that she has with how she's portrayed in the film. I mean, in the in the series, I Love Lucy. Uh, but yeah. Uh, Again, it's just another reminder, at least for me, and you definitely feel the frustration on my part about how ridiculous it is that in an alternate universe, an entirely reality was robbed of the rest of I Love Lucy because uh, Lucille Ball identified as a word that literally means nothing. And everybody, I think, should openly admit the fact that now that we're in the 2020s, right? Uh... This whole Red Scare thing, in particular with the word association of socialist and communism, is all bullshit. And clearly, uh, it was a lie. And I'm just waiting for people to admit that. But of course, that's not going to happen because there are useful tools by the corporate elite and the mainstream media to propagate whatever narrative they want to and to eliminate certain candidates um, from assuming power. Um, Sounds like a bunch of commie gobbledygook. Basically. Disgusting. Um, and again, it's but you also see it in the film, right? Uh, this exchange, because they also established, of course, and I did not know about this, Desi Arnaz enlisted uh, and was a service member uh, during World War II. Yeah. We talk about um, how... I, what? <laughs> I had read about um, comparing what was actually real and what was actually fake. Uh, that was fake? Uh, he was in the military. He served no time. Um, okay. He, I think, well, he served. It was one of those things where it's like, ooh, my knee spurs. Uh, anyway, I'm going to serve <laughs> out in like the entertainment side of, of, of serving. I see. Mm-hmm. Okay. What about the story of him being chased from his, from Cuba? He was of the chased by Bolsheviks. It was not by the Bolsheviks. No. It was about a previous, uh, it was before the Bolsheviks. It was more of the, um, the like workers, um, like workers, people uprising, uh-huh. and then like a a few years later, then was like the Bolsheviks. But they they tie those two together, and they're not tie they're they're not the same thing. Uh, but it was true that his father was the mayor of the second biggest city in Cuba. And then uh-huh. when those workers got um, took power, like farmers and stuff like that, of course they put him in jail. And then after he was released, him and his family, or I don't know if his dad too, but they Ricky himself, you know, came over to America. Yeah, okay. yeah, you see that discussion play out. Um... Even in today, mm-hmm. where it's like, well, what about workers' rights? Yeah, but what about authoritarianism? Mm-hmm. Well, we have that here. You're a part of it. Sorry, I'm just that's the tangent that I go off on. I know. <laughs> uh, I guess I can't help but go there. Um, but yeah. Also, there's a lot of other stuff as far as like if you're a fan of the series that uh, it's kind of like a little bit of a trivia trivia here. Like they they introduce how 
you know, Desi and Lucy want to introduce the fact that she's pregnant um, in the storyline of the series and how no one around them believes them that that's actually going to happen and are kind of like grossed out by it. Some of the reactions are hilarious. Like immediately when they announced that, like, like in the writer's room, when they announced like, oh, that she's pregnant, they all are like, oh, fuck, what are we going to do? And then she has to remind them, I haven't heard anybody congratulate that them was on the really fact good. that I'm having a baby. <laughs> that was, that was great. And then, of course, when Desi comes back, like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's even an earlier tense situation where, um, what's the, I don't know her act, her name, but uh, maybe um, in this. <laughs> In say the, maybe, in this, yeah. maybe in this, uh, in her role as one of the writers, kind of makes a snarky remark in the middle of a table read, uh, and everybody kind of yeah. like just like Oof. they're like, Ooh. and that's a very relatable. Where like you just say something, yeah, and then you realize like, oh shit, everyone's looking at me, and then you think about it, it's like, oof, that thing I said maybe is worse than I thought in my head, or can come off worse, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, I mean the man can write. No one's doubting. A lot of Absolutely. Great stuff. Yeah. Um but yeah, uh they definitely and I knew about this when I when I read other stuff about, you know, the series. The dynamic between uh William Frawley and Vivian Vance hated historically each other. they hated each other. Mm -hmm. But they were hilarious. Yeah. They definitely were. Uh, I, it's. I do think what's his name was a was a good choice. Uh, J.K. Simmons. J.K. Simmons. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's great in everything he does. Right. I haven't seen a single thing, and he's in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen a single thing where he was bad. Yeah. No. He's good in everything. Everything. Didn't he have a guest appearance in Arrested Development? I don't know why, but I keep thinking. I'm sure he did. Right. Like he's he he's been like in a, a lot of things. Like, like, like a a military person i don't remember but yeah no um, that that makes a lot of sense if that was the case mm -hmm. i can't remember though uh but yeah no he's fantastic yeah uh what did you make of the flashback scenes oh you know oh, the yeah. flashback scenes that where we see like where lucy came from and her struggles in the industry there's some of my favorite uh parts of the film i think yeah. I, I really liked seeing how all the because that's all the interesting stuff right like how they met how they got started mm -hmm. uh seeing how like her career as an actress and how she wanted to take it one way in, in the ways that they sort of clashed as they both mm -hmm. you know were trying to chase their dream the idea that like they met each other for like one hour <laughs> for a few minutes every morning because he's working nights and she's working mornings yeah and you know and i think that's true they say like the entire time they were married like they hardly saw each other except yeah. for on the set of i love lucy um all that stuff i think that's some of the best parts parts of the film at least that's what's interesting to me as a fan of the show right mm -hmm. and also the performances are uh really good so it it works Oh yeah, all across the board, very very good. Um, we'll definitely watch it again. I can definitely see a couple more watches out of this. You can catch it on Amazon Prime, or in theaters if it's playing miraculously somewhere near you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but not much longer because we got Spider Man, Kingsman, and Matrix Men, um, and all the stuff coming. So run while you can and see uh, the little movies because, yeah. In, a, in another time, this movie would would be like, would be getting a major theatrical play, but it's not. It's getting a limited play, and its main, uh, like, mission is to it, you know, hit hard with a streaming service, which is Amazon Prime. Yeah, but I mean, I we're at the point now, and f I guess we'll well, we'll, we can't, we'll talk no going about back. this more next episode. But right. well, I guess we'll talk about it now. Now that I think about it, um, yeah. box office is. This is when it, if this film came out fifteen years ago, I uh, you know box office hit you know maybe now it's a streamer because it's just not gonna play in box office. It, it, it has play. no play. No, e even um, we're at the point where. 
America's greatest director adapting one of the greatest plays of all time. One of the greatest musicals that won Best Picture and got ten Oscars, I think. Uh huh. And it's before in, in, in its original adaptation to to the screen, uh, gets zero play, makes no money, right? So yeah, it, to me, it's like if you can't get any sort of movement money wise on that, like, I mean, pack it up, right? Right. Well, uh, since you mentioned West Side Story, we're going to get to the review. Um, but before we get to that, let's go ahead and address what you mentioned. That is the box office. So everybody was really just like, the sky is falling, the sky is falling this past week when they saw, rightfully so, of course, the disastrous box office performance of West Side Story. Debuting to $10 million. Ouch, $10 million. This is a $100 million movie, by the way. Uh, it debuted to $10 million, the domestic box office. And overall, worldwide, it opened to 15. That's shit. Yeah. Again, a hundred million dollar movie. West Side Story. So, before we get into that, I do want to... I did some research here on recent uh, box office performances. A couple of things. Um, yes... We are in the pandemic era, and a lot of these films I'm going to bring up happened long before the pandemic came along. But I think you're going to find that there. It I feel that this says more about, at least to the performance of West Side Story, it says a lot about how the public regards this particular story, but then also how they've regarded Spielberg as of late, and then also how they've regarded musicals as of late. And I think the excuse at this point that we're in a pandemic, I, it's hard to really parse that when Spider-Man No Way Home is going to open to $150 million plus just this week. Like, the fact that the pandemic is the, an excuse, I don't know if that's... I mean, it still does. You still have to, like, adjust for it, but it's it's really hard to sit through that knowing how big Spider-Man's going to open and how nobody saw West Side Story. So this is what I did. I wanted to do a comparison to recent um, mainstream musicals for the domestic box office, not their overall cumulative gross, but how they opened, and then also Spielberg's recent films in the 2010 decade. And just, just to compare these numbers, right? So... Uh, with musicals and domestic openings, Dear Evan Hansen, the most recent one, opened to $7 million in its opening weekend. In the Heights, similarly to West Side Story, debuted to $11 million in its opening weekend. Both of these were in the pandemic era. Now, going before the pandemic era, Cats. I think Cats was the most successful musical of all time on Broadway, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, opened to six million dollars in its opening weekend. Um, Mary Poppins Returns. This is a sequel to a beloved musical, and it has the backing of Disney. This opened to twenty-three million dollars opening weekend. Uh, a little bit higher than the average at this point. The Greatest Showman, which ended up being a big box office success, only opened to eight million dollars in its opening weekend. La La Land, when it went wide, only four million dollars and then Les Mis Les Mis um, which did get play um, only opened to 18 million dollars in its opening weekend these are opening weekends across the board for mainstream musicals I think the most mainstream musicals of the past decade and I think you can tell just by these numbers that says a lot more about where this genre is going than it does about I guess any one movie Really, when you see there. Now, when it came to the Spielberg films, and this is a little bit more difficult because Spielberg is known for genre hopping, and these films really cater to different audiences. West Side Story, $10 million. Ready Player One in 2018, $41 million. The Post in 2017, $19 million. The BFG 
18 million dollars bridge of spies 15 million dollars lincoln 21 million dollars warhorse 14 million dollars and the adventures of uh, of tintin 9 million dollars so now we have two comparisons. We have how musicals have been doing opening weekends, and we have how Spielberg films have been doing opening weekends. With Spielberg, a lot of these were political dramas. Uh, some were an animated movie. One was a blockbuster action uh, film, and then one was a musical. And then, of course, you have the comparison with how the musicals are doing. So I have all of that out there just to provide more context for how Spielberg's recent films have opened and then also how recent musicals have opened. Peter, your your takeaway from all of this? Uh, musicals are financial sinkhole that no one should invest in. <laughs> That's depressing. This this is so depressing on so many levels because with with um well we'll look at the numbers. We have West Side Story, we have In the Heights, Dear Evan Hansen, and then also Tick Tick Boom. Um, that's not even counting the other musicals. But like Encanto, but that's animated, so it has a little bit of a different um, uh, classification with genre. But this is the most amount of musicals we've gotten in a year in a long time. And a lot of people felt like this was going to be the year of the musical. It was. It was not. No, it was. It, it, it just was. bombed. Yeah. It was just a bad year. A shit ton of musicals did come out. It's just no yeah. one gave a shit about them. Not a single one. Yeah. Which is crazy because musicals used to be the Avengers films. Mm-hmm. They they used that that's what it was. It was they were the big hits, musicals. Um Yeah. It sucks. I hate it. And I'm not even the biggest musical person, but it's it, it's just another nail in the coffin. And I really think I think at this point, I, I feel fairly confident in saying this, and that is that the pandemic accelerated the transition to movie theaters being a not even blockbuster only fucking movie machine, but like a MCU only movie machine. Which is even wow. That's yeah. the only movies that that are making money. Yeah, that are performing Widow, at Shang or Chi. expected. Yeah, that's the only movies people are. And so what's happening is people are even more picky about what movies they'll see. Before, when there's no pandemic, maybe they're like, eh, maybe I'll give this film a try, and maybe they'll go out and watch it. But now that they're being super picky, they're like, nope, I'm only going out there if I'm going to go see my Marvel film, and then that's it. So now, if if you're Marvel, you're Maybe, maybe you're not doing great, but you're the only one making money. Whereas with everyone else, I I don't. What other film is doing well that's not Marvel? Oh, I guess uh, No Time to Die, right? Like, but I I think a lot of that comes from the international box office. I, I, I if, if you're as thinking, well as Furious Nine. If you're looking at strictly the American box office, I if, it sucks. Yeah. So, I, <sighs> this is depressing because I do like musicals and I think I've seen all of these movies except for Greatest Showman. I've seen Les Mis, La La Land, Mary Poppins Returns, Cats, In the Heights, Dear Evan Hansen, and West Side Story. Hilariously, all of these movies range in quality, like radically uh, in quality. Um, hilariously, but then also um, kind of interestingly. And well, it's just sad. I think it's 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 good because you can see like you see the full range of quality. And it's like okay, with a change in quality, does anything change with the box office? Nope. No, not really. No, nope. it's just the musical. It's just these kinds of films and brown people. <laughs> That's another part of this aspect that you know. If I'm gonna be look. I've not been one to really play this card before. Oh, really? No. We're lying today? When have I ever played the brown card? Yesterday. 
in a podcast. Oh, okay. Last podcast. In what way? You were saying. You see? Okay. I find it increasingly disheartening how it is that we now are getting a lot of wonderful, diverse, rich films with different ethnicities and different minorities um, that are getting a lot of play and a lot of recognition and visibility on screen. You know, films like Crazy Rich Asians and Shang-Chi, films like Black Panther. Um, and of course, I mean, we have Coco, we have that. But we don't. I I feel like we've yet to really have had a real big live action film when it comes to Latinos, all kinds of Latinos, whether it be you know Afro Latinos or even you know the entrenched uh, national divisions like you know Cuban, Mexican, Colombian, all of that kind of stuff. That's not relegated to Disney animation. Um. Or animation period. Because with this year, in the Heights, the controversy notwithstanding, in the Heights and West Side Story, I think did a fantastic job um, with representing that community. I think in general, this year has been an amazing year for diversity in film. But for me... It's it really does sting a little bit more to see both in the Heights and West Side Story just completely crash and burn. Um and yeah. And I didn't even realize this, but I know I spoke with David about this aspect of the Eternals, maybe not so much with you, but it definitely did mean a lot to me to have a Mexicana like Salma Hayek be a superhero in a Marvel movie because she's pretty much the only one. And we're 26 some movies now into this universe and the most successful franchise in the business right now and the main Latino superhero, which is Moon Knight, is going to be on Disney Plus. Not in the movies. So... Um, which is why when you also, like, when you heard my disappointment that Salma Hayek wasn't as much in Eternals initially, that's where that was coming from as well, Mm -hmm. in case that wasn't clear before. No, you explained it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a little miffed, if I'm going to be honest, with that in particular, aside from the fact that, of course, with West Side Story... It is Steven Spielberg, who is my favorite director. But then, of course, that's just kind of how his audience has really aged, right? And so the average Spielberg film, let me look at these numbers, from 14 to 15 to 18 to 19. To, it's on the lower end, granted, but again, the older demographic are not going out to the theaters because pandemic. So that also is an explanation for why things went awry with West Side Story. Is that a key constituency of Spielberg's demographic just aren't going out and consuming movies these days, aside from all of the other stuff that we had mentioned. Um, so yeah, that's just really depressing all around. I can't find a single silver lining in all of this. I guess musicals are dead now. Yep. Video killed the radio star. Shall we get into the review of the film that we saw? Did we see it? Or did we I think experience it? It was an experience for sure. All right. West Side Story, directed by Steven Spielberg. Two youngsters from rival New York City gangs fall in love, but tensions between their respective friends build toward tragedy. See, when you... This is the thing. When I listen to that description, I think it's a gay love story between two gang members. What? You don't get that? (laughs) Read it again. Two youngsters from rival New York City gangs fall in love, 
but tensions between their respective friends build toward tragedy. Two gangsters? Two youngsters. Oh, yeah. From <laughs> rival New York City gangs. I, my mom, okay, I, I can see, I think, maybe where you made that leap, but my mind wouldn't immediately go to that. No. It's because you're homophobic. <sighs> Anyways, okay. it stars um, <laughs> an actor, uh, Rachel Zegler, <laughs> Rita Moreno, Ariana DeBois, David Alvarez, Carrie Stoll. Brian Darcy James. Corey Stoll. Corey, Corey Stoll. oh, what did I say? Carrie. Carrie, oh shit. Um, <laughs> Josh Andres Rivera. Uh, Mike Faust. Mike Feist. Mike Fast. Anna Isabel. Uh, Paloma Garcia Lee. Oh my god. Maddie Ziegler. <laughs> Andrea Burns. Kyle Allen, Curtis Cook, Jamie Harris, Ezra Menes, Sean Harrison, Patrick Higgins, Julius Anthony, Ricardo Zayas, Sebastian Serra, Carlos Sanchez Falu, uh, Hamilia Valasquez, Dalia Ryder, Hamaika Jones, Michael P.J. Marston, Atif Lanier, Cameron Sawyer, Ben Cook, Gabriel Soto, Tanar <coughs> Saint Vasquez, Chrissy Whitehead, El Eloise Crop. Uh, Michael Ronca, Ricky Ubera, and of course, last but not least, Andre Chagas. Did you say Rita Moreno? Yeah, like the second okay. name. Well, All right. third. Um, I'm not. We're not going to get into this at all. I'm just going to say off the top. Whatever you feel about Ansel Elgort, it's up to you to decide how you feel about that. I'm not going to tell you. We're not going to tell you how I feel about Ansel Elgort or the allegations made against it. All I will say is I have always been of the mind that it is highly unfair for everyone else involved in the cast and crew for this project to be boycotted because of Ansel Elgort. I also will add in the nuance, of course, that this film really couldn't feasibly be reshot because the film was basically mostly shot when those allegations surfaced. So there is that. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So you, but, well, actually, you know what? One more thing I will say. It is a delusion to think that Ansel Elgort's involvement in this film did anything whatsoever to the poor performance of the, at the box office for this movie. Oh, yeah. It, it had no, if, if you genuinely think that affected the box office, then you live online and have no grasp on reality. No, no one, one knows. even knows or cares. No, or, or cares. Or remembers, I, honestly. It was a long time ago at this point. Yeah. So and I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I'm just saying right. that's it is what it is. Like it in no way affected the box office. Um And that's where we'll we'll stop with Elgort's yeah, allegations. That's, that's and it. from from going forward we'll we'll address his performance mm -hmm. in the movie and that's that. Now, before we get to all of that, there are a couple of things that you and I should be, uh, you know, be transparent about, and that mm -hmm. is our feelings toward the original West Side Story film, and then also Spielberg's recent filmography. Oh, is that a cue for me to go? Yeah. Okay. okay. I, yeah, I, I thought that was generally clear, but uh, right. yeah. Um, as far as the original, I like it. It's It's good. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot to like. I think it's well made. It, it's I, if there's any downside, it's a film from 1961. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so it's like, yeah. um, which means a lot of it has aged poorly. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> like horrible. Like there's brown face. There's also brown talk. I guess like you have white people that are like basically doing the Essay. fake, right? No, like, they don't do that. Yeah, but, no. Yeah. Like I, I correct me if I'm mistaken, but was Rita Moreno the only like Latina in the cast? Yeah. And the rest of she was the only one light enough. But they there made it a might be darker, other didn't Latino. they? Yeah, maybe back then they didn't give a shit. They they'd get a white actor, just paints, put some brown smush on them, and then boom, right? 
<laughs> yeah, if you needed a, a Native American in your movie, grab the the nearest Italian and and, and brown no, him up a little bit. Oh, well, I for Indians, I mean for Native right. American. Uh, but yeah, so I don't have too much of a strong feelings about that film because. I don't know. I just don't. But yeah, I understand why it's considered a classic. And then as far as Steven Spielberg's recent filmography. We're talking about from 2011 and on. So from Tintin uh, to Ready Player One. Oh, specifically. yeah. Um, not clearly a, a, a downward slope, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know if he's created a Spielberg classic since then. Um. I think the last one that people really regale in such a way is like, um, what is it? Syriana or some shit? Syriana? Um, no, 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 no. Um, fuck. I forgot. The one with the Olympics. Um, you mean Munich? Murders. Munich. I, I don't know where I got that from. I think there's another movie. I don't know. <laughs> um, Munich, yeah, Munich. I uh-huh. think that's like the last one. And then after that, I know there's a lot that you enjoy, and they're not bad. In my, in my, I've seen a few of his films since then. I got quite a few actually. Uh, not bad, nothing I love, and a few I maybe hate. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of where we are right now. With West Side Story, I think I I basically agree with you. The original movie, I thought it was very it was enjoyable, but it's also it's a very dated movie for not just of course the things that have aged horribly in terms of representation that to the side, but it's just it's very much a movie made in the time of 1961, and I don't know some of the some of the stuff just um, the music for the most part was was good. I don't think I really felt the the true like wonder of the overall soundtrack um until this new one which I'll get to in a minute but there were songs that I realized had come from that story that I didn't realize like I feel pretty or America or somewhere which are songs that I've heard previously in other places but didn't know that they were from this film particularly oh yeah so I but, feel pretty right <laughs> But generally speaking, the the performances are all right in the movie. The only one that really, I think, kind of like caught my attention was Rita Moreno as Anita, which she ended up winning the Oscar for that performance. Um, but aside from that, I I honestly can't say I cared all that much. I liked it fine, but it didn't really capture me at all, um, which is surprising to me because... Well, maybe I'm maybe I'm more a fan of musicals lately, but maybe not so much from that era. I don't know. It's hard to really parcel, to be quite frank with you. How do you feel about that movie? I usually chop it up to sometimes movies connect and sometimes they don't. As is the case with the Spielberg filmography, because I feel the complete opposite of you. Oh, yeah. uh, a lot of these movies really resonated with me. Um but I also agree with you that there are some that I I hate. <laughs> so it is a mixed bag here. Um, like, just to go down the list, I I loved Tintin. I know you kind of, like, were whatever about it, but I loved Tintin. You want to know something? What? I've only seen it once. I've only seen it once, too, but I, yeah, I thought Yeah, but when was... I saw it was a lot longer ago than, oh. the la- than when you saw it. That's what I mean. This was 10 years ago. Yeah. This was 10 yeah. years ago. I love War Horse. That thing made me cry so much. Uh, that was such a beautiful movie. I do enjoy War Horse. And then, of course, Lincoln. I mean, I, I feel like I've oh, said... Okay, you know what? I'll take it back. Lincoln was his last classic, classic. I think, yeah. that most consider. I love that movie so much. Then, of course, is Bridge of Spies, which I feel is highly underrated. That's one of my favorite Spielberg films. I love it. Um, but just, I do. And we get into that the bf we don't have to get into it the, uh, i mean we've gone into that i meant yeah the bfg i couldn't get through it hits i couldn't get through that film so like for me keep in mind like the last four films i thought were great and i love them bfg just i it's couldn't nothing. finish it yeah. i couldn't finish that movie 
Then there was the post, which I really... <laughs> That's of another course, one. That one that's just like was always in a play for me, I feel. Um yeah, I I love that movie. But then there is Ready Player One. I arguably think that's the worst movie he's ever made. I've never seen every movie he's ever made. So You've seen most of his movies though. If all the ones I've seen of him, it's my least favorite. Yeah. So I can't come down and say definitively. But, but you I do mean, hate the film. It's on the, I hate it. I, yeah. Yeah, no. I, I genuinely hate it. I, I hate everyone. I hate the characters. <laughs> everyone involved. I hate what it <laughs> represents. I'm not going to say, like, individually, the people involved. Like <laughs> I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> that PA that worked in Fuck You. Like, no, not that. But just, <laughs> I hate what it represents and what it says and the lame way it tries to save it. Like... Mm-hmm. It's it's just a film that I loathe. To me, Ready Player One was definitely the film that Spielberg um, treated as disposable. And he, in interviews, I feel, revealed that the only reason he made the film was because that was the film that fans of his have been begging for him to make. And that he made the film with certain decisions that he thought were the ones that his fans wanted the most. And I feel like when you do that, you get exactly what you get in this movie. It's, it's the definition of, of a film quote-unquote made for the fans yeah and like it's one of the movies i think the one movie you can say where he you 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 don't feel like he wanted to make this movie at all no no not Not at all all. whereas at least with the other ones you can say he definitely wanted to make those yeah and for me when it comes to like lincoln bridge of spies and the post those are a group of stories about in many ways uh a true sense of heroism more so than a lot of superhero movies that people just kind of, kind of like, pff, they're like talky, boring awards, prestige films. What, 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 what is all of this? And the message overall is what, uh, I, um, I will say a lot of the, the, the praise that West Side Story got initially from a lot of the people are like, I remember what you said about the post. I remember what you said about Bridge of Spies, and it wasn't too kind. And I, uh, to, yeah. to those people, you were right. Don't let him gaslight you, okay? No, uh, they were wrong, <laughs> flat out, um, completely. So, with all of that being said, I don't think the reactions you're about to get from us should be any bit surprising (laughs) about this particular movie. Um, I'm going to admit that I let myself just be completely drained of any excitement for West Side Story. First because of Peter, because of course Death of Hope. Um, But then because of all the people you know, pitting this movie up against In the Heights and how, like, In the Heights was going to do so much better in terms of, like, reception, in terms of box office, because that was the film that warranted, I guess, a reason being made, and everybody was like, why is he doing a West Side Story? Granted, that was a a reasonable question for why this would be a movie Spielberg would be interested in making, especially if it is such a classic as it is. But it definitely caught me as well where when we came to the beginning of the year I was far more interested in In the Heights than I was West Side Story um, and it almost seemed like a self-fulfilling prophecy where it, where uh, West Side Story would fall on its face and In the Heights would become the critic starling or the award starling mm-hmm. but that didn't happen um, and the reactions that came out of this film initially were quite surprising and in particular some of the people that have reacted to this film are unbelievably surprising. Um, so Peter and I did not agree on this movie, I feel. Or at least we can't agree all the way. We can't we can't agree all the way because <sighs> this is an adaptation of the West Side story. It was a previous movie and it was a previous and it originally was a stage play, play on Broadway. But really what the story is is Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. And a lot, I feel, of how you're going to feel about West Side Story really hinges if you like the original story by Shakespeare 
of Romeo and Juliet. And I'm not sure how much you can get around that. If you like that story, you might like it here. If you really don't like it, I don't know if this movie is for you. See, the thing is, I'm the weirdo for hating that story. It's one of the most beloved stories. You think of you're all a time. weirdo? I don't think anybody I, think... I, I know liked that story in high school when we were forced to read in it. In high school, though. Well, sure. I mean, it's it's one of the most beloved stories of all time for it a is. reason. Yeah. Right. For a reason. So, I, I think most people will be fine with it. I fucking hate <laughs> that fucking story. Because it's just feel with loathsome people doing stupid things and I hate it. And this film it's it's in its DNA, right? Like this is basically a quote unquote modern at least at the time retelling of that story. So a lot of that is gonna be here. Granted it's still set in the fifties. Yeah, well, that's why I said quote-unquote modern. Right. At the time, it was modern. I guess, relatively speaking, between now and when Shakespeare first wrote the story, mm-hmm. it's still modern. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's in there. And that's why I, it's, I can't hold it against the film, or at least I find it very hard to hold it against the film, but that still doesn't mean it doesn't bother me. Right. When certain things happen mm-hmm. and certain decisions are made. And all I'm left thinking is I want all of you to die. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the happy ending. Um, <laughs> like to me, how is it a tragedy if I want to see these people, uh, fucking die like to me i'm sorry like (laughs) that's not a tragedy that's what we call uh a a, a pleasant ending to the story right so what you gonna do we can do spoilers right like come on like we've basically given away the yeah absolutely but uh, let's not get off initial i'm not trying to go all crazy oh yeah i'm just saying i just we're still on the initial impressions portion of this. Um, yeah, I am not a terrible fan, a terribly big fan of Romeo and Juliet. I wouldn't say I hate it, but I don't necessarily like it all that much. That being said, I I think what we do share, though, is a love for romanticism uh, and romance in films. Sure. Oh, yeah, of course. And so that, I think, with it being ingrained into the story, has a leg up, at least with me. Mm-hmm. Granted, of course, the things that deterred you from it, I, I totally get. <laughs> I really do. Because cause, um, m- all of the issues you have with, like, generally speaking, not liking anybody, I felt I had that same exact reaction when I watched the 1961 version. Side note, these movies are separated by exactly 60 years. Yeah. See, that's the thing, though. I think it worked better for me, the 1961 version, because it was 1961. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Like, I, I feel like that shit worked better in that. Maybe it's that sort of like removed time period where it's like, well, you know, that was a long time ago. So um, you feel like you can excuse it there more in that version than this one. I, well, subconsciously, I, I think that's what happened. Well, I think this is where we're going to find a lot of disagreement because the the first movie, it just, it did nothing to make me care about any of those people. And I, like you, wanted to see them just die at the end of it. I feel with this version of the story, there was more nuance added in terms of dialogue, in terms of... I know you're making the face, but like... For, for no, me, I, I, I was like, okay. In I, terms no, of I dialogue, in terms of scenes, there was more nuance added to all of the main characters to where... And context, much needed context to really get where they're coming from and their rationale to really make a lot of the really admittedly brain-dead decisions that are made by the characters... To make it to make those decisions a little bit easier to swallow all around by all of what you see here to this. I love the film. 
I'm not sure how surprising it is for me to say that, but I did love this this version of the story. I've seen it now three times. Really? Yeah. Since was the when we when we saw it was that the first time? Yeah. Yeah. And since then, you've gone yeah. back and saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit! I I fucking love this. It, it, oh wow! Primarily because of what a spectacle it is, though. It is so beautiful. It is. I mean, I don't. I don't know if I've seen a musical directed this well in ever, like at least in this like period. The uh, the camera angles, the the big musical numbers, just like take my breath away. the The music, the songs are so, and I I, I personally I feel this way. I think not just in terms of performance is this cast vastly superior than the 1961 version but the songs are also sung better they're performed better i think the dancing is much better i think the particular set pieces in which uh these numbers are executed in are kind of perfection i i love this i really do and i've kind of like really been like obsessed with the soundtrack all around like this really did sweep me away and I think this is Spielberg's next classic. I really do. I, 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 this is movie magic for me. It's like when you're sitting there and you know it, when you can't really explain it all the way through, but when it catches you, it just grabs you. <laughs> I love the eye rolls and it, <laughs> it just like refuses to let you go. Uh, I've waited a long time to see a movie like this and I've loved a lot of movies this year, but. This got better every time I saw it. I it really did for me. Um, it's just a from a crafts perspective, and this is where we will agree. It is just impeccable. It looks beautiful. The costumes, the cinematography, uh, the production design. It's just up and down the list. It's as great as you can make the story to be. I feel. Um. So. We can definitely get into like the specifics of it, but this one is it's it's the top ten is going to be interesting. That's a tease. Um, when this when this when when it's all said and done, but like I I this is the this may be I think this is probably the best movie Spielberg has done since Lincoln, maybe easily. It may be one of my new favorites. I don't know yet, but. I, this thing kind of has me possessed. So, which is not something I expected because the original version of this movie kind of did little to nothing for me. But I feel like there is, when I look at what the story really is about, at least how how, how I saw it, it really seems to be, and this goes back to what Romeo and Juliet, and I guess for whatever lessons it was trying to, you know, impart on the audience at that point kids are fucking stupid that's definitely the subtext um which i mean yes it, what happens when you let hate just fester and what ultimately the story becomes is what this tragedy is is that love was so overcome with the hate that's around all of the main characters. And a lot of it is, a lot of the film is joyous. A lot of the film is vibrant, but it definitely ends in a very just like downbeat note. And of course you have that last, it's basically word for word the same as it was in the 1961 version where it's like, you know, um, what was it? Maria says, I can kill because now I hate or now I have hate. And ultimately, what kind of brings my mind into like what, yes, Spielberg wanted to make this movie for the longest period of time. He made a promise to himself as a little boy that he wanted to do this since he was 10 years old. Um, but it, it kind of, and again, to my mind, it feels a, a lot of the, the, the subtext going on in the story almost feels a lot like what you've seen from Spielberg out of Lincoln, out of Bridge of Spies, out of The Post, and his personal 
not just like I guess patriotism, but his personal sense of humanity really linger um, lately in his response to the times. And mm -hmm. in sure. this particular movie feels like his way of saying like this is what happens when you let hate win nobody wins and all you're left with is just this desolation and for me i'm not particularly used to musicals of this scale ending like this which is interesting because a lot of it is so joyous but it ends in such a well i guess that's it guys go home that's the end of the movie so we can talk more about this in depth but generally for me i love this okay I also like how he both sides the hate. Mm. Very good. Very nice. I agree. He did a good job of no, <laughs> no, really, I do. Like I, I, I know yeah. you do. I know you. <laughs> no, because like what I mentioned earlier, like there's much more nuance. Whereas mm. in the in the original film, and I know we feel differently about this, the Jets are kind of, and they still are, xenophobic, racist assholes. But in Spielberg's version, there is far more context. There is this, there is connection between the sharks and the jets of them both being gentrified out of their community. And there are mentions in the screenplay about the backgrounds of these particular, yes, white kids who are, yes, full of hate and, yes, racist. And that's not at all excused. And, yes, there's a both sides of the situation. But it doesn't, I, which you're, I, it doesn't make uh, it any less true. I think for me, it definitely I, landed. I, I what you're trying to say is Steven Spielberg's a Bernie bro. Got it. Um, Did, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't the first time I think he he's both sides this thing. Like remember Munich? Of course. He both sides everything. Yeah. Um, I'll say this. unless you're a Nazi. I ag yeah, that's true. Um, I don't know if a white nationalist is that different than a Nazi, but okay. Uh. I agree insofar as it is his most masterfully made film in as long as I can remember. Right? Yeah. Like every shot, every move of the camera, visually, how everything looks, how it's lit, the 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 choreography, the costumes, it's why cinema was invented. Yeah. Right? Fan fucking tastic. And I was actually really with this film. Up until the rumble, about half the rumble, halfway, until about the rumble, <laughs> yeah. And then the rumble happens, and then decisions start being made, and my anger starts to overtake my love of everything that was going on in the first half. And by the time it ends, I wanted all of them in body bags. <laughs> That's quite specific. Um, I, I, it's like, can I, I just, Please. I heard you talk yes, forever about what Yes, go you off. Loved. Let go me off. talk about what I don't I like. did okay. all of that knowing you were going to get into this. Yes. That way I make sure that I, because usually when, when you go off, then I, things slip my mind. So I did all of that to make sure my piece was said. Take as much time as you'd like. Sure. So, um, this is the thing. Uh, it's a certain actor who plays the lead whose name escapes me for whatever reason. <laughs> um, what what was his name? Troy? Tony. No, that's High School Musical. Tony. <laughs> You've never seen High School Musical, I don't think. I have. Okay. You have? Yeah. Really? I thought you said you Didn't dropped mean... off Disney Channel. Why it wasn't my choice, but I have seen it. Yes, um, Tony, Tony. No, no, that's Italian. How did Anton, say it? Tony? That's how they say it. Oh my god. Hola, Tony. Yeah, it's like that. Um, <laughs> he, and maybe this is me. I don't know. If I still don't know if this is a positive or a negative. He comes off stupider than I initially remember. There are differences in this version, right? So uh, what, what was, at least in my mind, what was changed with Tony in this instance, mm -hmm. the little bit of story or the background they gave him is that he went to prison for a whole year because they had a rumble the previous year where he almost killed someone. 
And they make it a beat in the film where he has an exchange with, with Riff saying that he kind of views himself he's he's afraid of himself because once he let he lets out the monster he kind of loses control altogether right whereas in the original sure. film that that doesn't exist that's not there no he's just trying to hook up be better or but he is also implied he's trying to be better right in general um i i i guess i kind of like that but i i mean in, i'm not i wasn't even talking about i know that. what i'm saying is i know you had to add the how the stuff you like we're neg we're doing negatives you stupid i didn't realize okay um um, he comes off almost to the point where it's like uh, maybe he needs to be in a home because he comes off like um he comes off really dumb Uh, like his intelligence level is can't like, the se- the same be said of everybody to an extent? Him specifically, though, and I also think it's the way is it the performance or is the writing. I think it's, I think it's everything. Oh, okay, I think it's the writing. I think it's the for sure. I think it's the performance. It's everything. He comes off a little bit like not even a teenager, but like a five year old. <laughs> you mean Peter Parker that found that found a puppy, right? Uh, and a puppy named. Um, Maria. Fucking Latina girl, Maria. Um he he comes off just a little bit too dumb mm. in my eyes. Like I he should be dumb, but just a little bit too dumb. Maria I thought was great. Um I th- I thought the Rachel was really good. I thought she was really great. Yeah, she's yeah. amazing. Until See the rumble. That, I don't agree at that point, but I, I I can see why you feel that way because the and, and let's just get into it. So until the rumble, what happens in the rumble is her brother Bernardo is killed by Tony, who is her love, mm-hmm. and then when they see each other next, they fuck. Yeah, that's basically her response <laughs> is to have sex with him and then run away with him, which. I know it's funny, but I buy into it. They're in love. That's the I don't, thing. I they don't, love each I don't other. I don't buy their like, love. That overcomes all. At it. least that's what the attempt it is. At not. least that's what it should be. It's a terrible attempt. It's not. <laughs> it's bad. I don't buy their love. They see each other at t- for two seconds. At a, like, I'm fucking Snow White had more development it, it, as far as love goes. And I'm pretty sure that's like a date rape story. Um. Uh, he comes off again like the mentality of a five-year-old and but she while she's enamored by him she comes off a lot smarter like like i i like her as a she's a lot more aware and she comes off yeah and she has a good head on her Mm -hmm. shoulders i'm like i like this maria this is cool so then just the decision she makes after the rumble makes so much less sense in my head And, and and it's sort of like whiplash as far as her character oh, okay. goes and i understand this is just that story yeah and you, like it's kind of like complaining with spider-man it's like why does he shoot web the physiology doesn't make sense <laughs> you know i get i get it you know that's why i'm not it's not really a knock towards it's just an movie. explanation for how you feel about it it's just how yeah. i feel it, it's just i it doesn't gel with me and it makes me not like the characters mm. I guess that's the thing. I don't want them to end up together because in my mind, it's like you're literally excusing him because she doesn't even hear out what happened. All she knows is he killed her brother. She knows zero details. And her answer is, well, like, well, you can do nothing wrong because I love Mm -hmm. you. And like I told you, it's almost like an abuser mentality. Like, because if if you're response is to fuck him after he murders your brother then like what do you do if he hits you but i love him what do you what do you do if if, if he does it like this isn't love this is it's not it's like the stupidest child's idea of it's lust you saw each other for for two seconds at a fucking party and right but this is the thing that's that's literally what Romeo and Juliet yeah. is. It's two stupid fucking kids. 
I, 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 and at that point, it was the Capulets <laughs> and the Montagues. And here, it's the Jets and yes, the Sharks. Yes, we yes, all yes, know yes, the yes. thing. My thing is, I, I see what you're saying. And mm-hmm. maybe this just gets to a difference between you and I. And I think I've noticed this when it comes, in particular, with how we're, when we talk about musicals. Do not misunderstand. Mm. I am not going to say okay. you don't like music. You're going to say some offensive I'm shit. I'm not right going to say you don't like music. You do like music. It's just you and I don't seemingly have a lot of common ground when it comes to the music that we like. But I like the music. Wait, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. That's why I don't want you to misinterpret what okay. I'm about to say okay. by getting that out of the way with. Okay. But I, I, I feel like this came up when we, when, when we discussed Hamilton. Right about, or maybe also in the Heights, about like certain characters making decisions that don't make narrative sense, right? Or at least this mm-hmm. must have come up at some point when it comes to discussing musicals. For me, I am far more lenient when it comes to those kind of scenarios in these movies because they're musicals mm-hmm. and because they're over exaggerated. And yeah. But here's why I don't buy that. And I'm not even gonna let you finish. I was finished because. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I did let you finish. You're, you uh-huh. are welcome. Um, I love over exaggerated storytelling. Mm-hmm. I live for it. Okay, it's my favorite kind. I like Greece. <laughs> it's a very over exaggerated like at this point. I know, I know, but who doesn't love West Side Story? Greece is an over exaggerated musical mm-hmm. where they make silly decisions and they're all high school teenagers and blah da blah da blah. I love it. I have a good time. Heightened reality, whole thing. Again, I can buy some silly decisions, but when you're making direct decisions that make me just go, I hate mm. you, it's not, it's not, it's not that it's a stretch That's fair. to reach yeah. there. Like, I can believe that she would still want to be with what's his name, even though he killed her brother. You could have had a scene mm-hmm. where, and again, because you're changing right. stuff, you you already decided you're changing stuff to make it more mm-hmm. modern or just to make it work better, right? So if if, if they one don't fuck, and and two, he very much in detail explains what happened to her what happened at that fight and like really makes a plea to her about like his love for her and how he never wanted any of this to happen and he really tried his best not to have what happened happened and that um he just couldn't convince the brother not to do it because she understands how much of a hothead her brother is and how, you know, because the, the, the whole beginning of the movie is how much he fucking, you know, how he says he hates gringos and, and all that shit, right? So it, I, I think if you do that, and again, her response isn't to fuck him, but it's like, okay, I still love you and, and let's get out of here, mm-hmm. right? Heightened, heightened, still heightened, ridiculous choice. I can roll with it, right? But if her reaction is, I'm not even going to ask you what happened. I'm just going to let you know right now I love you and get in here and take off those clothes. Like, ridiculous. Is it ridiculous Fucking, if they're kids? Like, yes, they're yes. They're stupid kids? They're, she's 18. She's 18 and he's older. Fuck that. No. There's not much of a difference in my mind between 18 and 17 as far as the mind is concerned. But that's just how I see and it. And any 17-year-old that's that stupid, <laughs> I would still hate. I, I'm sorry. That's fair. That's fair. It, it, it's, I hate, it's, at that point, I just like, I don't care about you people as characters. And, and the fact that you're so quick to just go like, I don't care what you did, just hop in bed, mm-hmm. tells me, okay, you don't love each other. This isn't love. This is, I, it's not it. Okay. Um, But again, that's what Romeo and Juliet was. So I can't say it's not what it's supposed to be um uh, what's her name which one the the one that runs the store rita moreno plays valentina rita moreno valentina 
I really liked her. That's another character similar to Maria. I really liked her in the first half. By the second half, she's kind of like, how about you do something? Uh, 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 like, like she comes in, she walks in, she like she knows these are fucking gang members that just ended up killing people. She lets them stay in, in her store, and then they practically rape an, an another woman, and and she just kind of gives them a stern. Oh, you you guys should be ashamed for yourselves. And then that's it. I thought at the very least she would scream for them to get the fuck out of her store. Uh, and, and, or anything like that. But it's just like... <sighs> kind of disappointed in you guys. R rape is kind of bad. And it's like... I, <sighs> you're too passive. I Well, yeah. you see, that's another instance. I saw it the other way entirely. I... I, up, th I thought that was a powerful scene in terms of how reserved it was. I thought that she blew them away just by saying the things that she said. I was moved uh, and kind of like I had chills just listening to that whole, the, just watching that whole instance and then seeing how she, all of the things that she said there, basically saying that, you know, she knew all of them when they were kids and that you've grown into rapists and she just walks away. And I think you feel, at least the Jets themselves, feel the devastation of what just happened. Mm -hmm. And I think one of them even says, we're done here, and then they walk out. And that was the moment that the Jets just kind of died. At least just how I took that moment. I mean, that's the level of stern talking to I get when I get a bad grade. And when I got a bad grade on my spelling test. I, I would expect something a little better when you just tried to gang rape someone. But I don't know. I guess that's just me. Um, I, I, <laughs> and I felt really bad for Anita in this movie. Oh yeah, uh, more more so than even the old one, because like that's another thing that just made me start to hate maria it is like anita the love of her life just died right. and she comes home to you his sister mm -hmm. having sex with his murderer and then your response is but we're in love and now i want you to accept him in your life and also help me run away with the murderer so we can live a happy life together uh, man, man i <laughs> but you see i uh, man. that that oh, whole man. musical number first and foremost um was fantastic between those two and i get beautifully performed they're, they're just you can't get any better than that but again how i interpreted that sequence was whether in, in, uh, are you going to choose love or are you going to choose hate? I thought that was the whole point of that. I know the specifics kind of fly in the face of all of this. I, I get you and I understand your point of view. But the point of that song, or at least the way that I interpret it is, what are you ultimately going to choose? Hate or love? And clearly, the whole, I think, guess, arc of that song was to get Anita to a place where like that, that line in the song where it's like, I, I thought you knew better. I thought you knew what being in love felt like. Sometimes you just can't, you can't help it. You can't control who it is you're in love with. And I thought you of all people would be understanding of it. Yes, the murder. Yes, all of that. But at this point in the movie, at this, you know how it is. Like that, that just goes out the window. It's the story that, that it is. Yeah. And what it is, is I hate it. <laughs> and I hate these people. Anita should have never been put in this situation. You don't gotta hate, but you sure as fuck do not need have to love. I no, 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 no. There's a difference between not living in hate for the person uh, that killed the love of your life, and then actively helping that person that killed the love of your life get get away with it, and and go off and and live their 
love story. No. No. That's a huge difference in my mind. Again, though, but this is a musical, though. This isn't real life. <laughs> what does that have to fucking do with anything? I just anything? feel like you're, you're really projecting your own thing into this. I... What, what own thing? Like this? This is literally I, the like context you, of like the you're scene talking about in the story. Okay, what else did you dislike? Like this is literally what it is. I can't change that, and I understand that, and I know people dig it. I just don't. What else? Did every you every, dislike? every time I get to this point in the story, I just hate it. Um. I liked uh, Chino. Um, he should have used all the bullets, but uh, he was a good character. Um, I don't know if this is a negative or positive. It was. In- it's interesting how they have that like trans character. Yeah, anybody's it's just kind of. That's just following the whole story. Right. Um, it 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 feels like something that would be in a play. Right. So I think it fits in that way. Um, what it adds, I don't know, but it also doesn't feel out of place. Right. So, eh, you know, it, that's I, it, it, I. If you were to tell me, like, yeah, West Side Story is gonna have a trans character, I'd be like, what? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of cool that they're able to fit it in there and it not feel out of place. Um, I agree with you. A lot of the 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 songs and blocking and singing works better in this film than the original. Like that whole like uh the fucking jets. Uh, the opening number. No, not the opening. Oh, you mean number. the officer the, uh, game? Yeah, officer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and here's another thing. Again, this is where you can say it's a musical. In response to what I'm about to say. <laughs> yeah, this is just me. I I I can't take seriously the like hardcore gangsters that, that are, that I are will out here allow. killing each that other. That I will allow. That that never that didn't work for me in the original. Like it didn't work <laughs> for me here. It's just, it's just it, it makes me laugh when like we're in a serious it, moment it makes me laugh. and we see like all of them just like break out like, into ballerina dancing and uh, it, yeah. it's the ba- it's the ballerina yeah. dancing. If, if it was that? more yeah, like hard yeah. I mean I, I don't I don't want us to I don't want people to listen listen to us feel as if like we're designating ballerina dancing as a purely feminine thing, but for the era and for the people who that this film is representing, that would be a thing that they would not be into. Well, yeah. And and the movie itself like makes that point, right? Like, like I think they make fun of someone for singing and then they call the trans character, like they call, they call him a freak. And they do a lot of stuff to be like, yeah, we're macho, mm-hmm. um, machismo. I mean, they, they basically rape people. somebody. Yeah, yeah, like like it's it's a lot of toxic masculinity right. going on. And then while they're saying like, I'll split your head open, they're also like step ball change one two one two, you know, <laughs> and, and doing like ballerina right. moves that you know within the movie itself. They would turn around and call anyone they saw do it like an the, a gay yeah. slur. So it's kind of a weird dichotomy. Yes, uh huh. Um, it's not that big of a deal. That that is something that it only bothers me in so much as that it makes me laugh. That's the thing. Whatever. Yeah. It, I can't take it serious. Yeah. Like in like in the very beginning when they're like, eh. Like they're terrorizing the town, and then they're like ballerina steps mm-hmm. as as they go down the, the the street as these these badass uh gangsters or whatever, um, yeah, and, and that's where I think it's fair to say like, but it's a musical. I I know, I know, it's just my head, I guess. Um. Uh, yeah, on the whole, like. It's 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 just for me. It's just that second half where it becomes 
And and I guess what bothers me is because they did make changes within the first mm-hmm. half to make it the story more palatable and make it go like, yeah, like this, this helps everything that's going right. on, right? Like, why would a member of the Sharks suddenly try to turn good Mr. Goody Two Shoes and this, this and that? And it's like, okay, like this whole story of, you know, like he almost killed someone. He went to jail. He, he's trying to turn his life around um that's why he's working at this store like like all of that stuff good i think works really well works really good oh and i and i never answered said this before but the the main actor for the leader of the the mike feist i thought he was really really Mm -hmm. good i really really liked him he was really good uh so they they made changes i feel to the first half to really make the just to plus the story and go like okay this is this works more for me that i kind of wish they would have done that in the second half because it's almost a a, a deeper there's a deeper jump in logic because the first half works better in my opinion the fact that they didn't change the second half makes it feel worse when it shouldn't Mm. as opposed to like the original where it's just kind of equal, mm-hmm. right? Um, if if anything I'm saying makes sense, and oh, and then also, we already talked about this. I I know you disagree. The change of where they put, I feel pretty. Um, I'm still making up. I I, I'm get... still making up my mind about how I feel about that particular switcheroo. I don't know yet. But... I get why they did yeah. it, but. It's kind of a, a, a tonal mm. shift. And I'm kind of not as able to enjoy the number and have fun. Because it's supposed to be a fun and number. And it is fun. Right? It's like, done really well. Really... Yeah. No, it's done really well. But it's like, eh, I can't really get into it because it's just like, it, it, oh, we're doing this now? <laughs> oh, okay. I, <laughs> you know? I, I Especially because it's like the whole movie, fun, you know... It, it's really joyous and mm-hmm. fun and then it reaches that rumble and then shit changes yeah. right there's there's a there's a change and it's changed it's changed it's changed well i feel pretty go going back to it being changed 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 to the rest of right. the film right so it kind of messes with the trajectory of the film i kind of wish it to me i like that oh shit moment of the rumble where like this isn't just kids playing uh, fucking, you know, my, you, we're, 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 we're gang members, you know, because th- that's how it kind of plays it off. Like the first time they get a gun, they're pretending, yeah. bah, 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 shooting at each other. Like they're, they're kids, very much stupid kids, right? Once you hit the rumble, it's, they start to realize, oh shit, this is real. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, and the movie becomes more or, or should, right. I feel like, oh fuck, there's consequences. Um, and then, of course, it should continue all the way till it hits you with that sad ending, right? And and I, I just I understand why they tried to sort of do that inverse with "I Feel Pretty." I just don't think here's it works a, fun, as well. a fact about it. Uh, apparently, mm-hmm. that's uh, "I Feel Pretty" in this version is how it was in the original Broadway play. It was really? placed there, and in the film, they they changed it around. Mm-hmm. So this is more of a, okay. a restoration to where it was, which that in and of itself is interesting. That's interesting. Um, you know what that feels like then? Tell me if I'm mm. wrong. It feels like the rumble happens and then it's the intermission and then they come back to I feel pretty. Yeah. And you had a big opening number to get you back in the. See, that's the thing. It That makes sense for okay. a play. Because you now, need a I big can't be fun... sure that the rumble is where the midway point happens in the play because I've never seen it. Oh, okay, I don't know. Okay, I've never seen it either. But that's what it feels like, right? I can see that where you, you see that first mm-hmm. half and it's a hell of a cliffhanger where you go to intermission and then you come back and you have that number to like pump the audience back up and then you're back into it. Um, I I think that makes sense as a play. I think as a film, it's a different right. ball game. Uh yeah, as much <laughs> as as I I have shit on the film, and you have very much tried to defend said shitting, 
Uh, I think it's a very good film. I really l- absolutely love a lot of the film. Like, absolutely love so much of it. Uh, so many of the numbers. I love the uh, the American America number. Was, oh, my God. Yeah. So good. So that's, good. I, and to me, that's uh, why I led with, like, why I was swept away. Like, just the, the masterful way that the film is made. Mm-hmm. And the songs are just so soaring. Like, I, America um tonight tonight maria all of them are just like hitting one one after the other not just in terms of how they're sung but the the whole blocking of it the production design um what did you make of there is a significant change with one of the songs Mm -hmm. in the original movie uh maria and anton sing somewhere in this version, it's given to Valentina. Somewhere there's a place for oh, us, a time and a place yes, for yes, us. Yes, Somewhere. Yes, yes. Yeah. And mm-hmm. to me, the way I read it, because you see in that sequence, you have Rita Moreno um, doing the number in this version mm-hmm. of it. And it's also cut with. Uh, the other main characters that are left at this point in the film. We see Ariana mm-hmm. DeBose's uh, Anita, who does an amazing job here, by the way. Oh, my God. Uh, we see her, uh, you know, filling out paperwork at the police station and then walking away from it. We also cut to Maria. And um, <laughs> this is... We, <laughs> oh my, we cut to Maria and, and Tony and everything. And it's like... And her perspective of it it almost i think gives a different um interpretation this time around to the song whereas in the original film it was definitely just exclusively about the two lovers um Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what the original film was almost like basically exclusively consumed with and prioritizing with whereas in this version with the more added backstory and nuance to some of these characters and with somewhere kind of recontextualized where we don't entirely forget about Anita because she still has a role to play in this as well, that it's really kind of more than just about the two lovers here, but it's really about all of these people that were really just caught up in this unfortunate, hate-filled tragedy. Like at some point, somewhere, there will be a place for everybody in this movie where there will be peace to live together. and happiness and all mm-hmm. of that. Yeah, no, I definitely read it that way. Especially because who the character that mm-hmm. sings it, um, she's the one that's kind of, that's that's pushes right. for that, right? They talk about she was married to yeah. a white man, and she's the one that has like one foot in both worlds and just wants them to live together mm-hmm. peacefully, right? Like, like so, yeah, one, yeah, one hundred percent. And and I do like that change. I like, yeah. Because it speaks to a more broader thing rather than... A love story between yeah. only two people. Uh, yeah. And it's like, no, this is, this is more than that. And yeah, for sure. I like that change. And also it gives uh, Rita some... A big thing to do here. Some, that's that's one of the big yeah. songs of the film. Um, and uh, it's probably going to get her an Oscar nomination. Let's yeah. hope. And I'm just happy to see her at the Oscars. Who um, turned 90, by no. the way, the day we saw this movie. Yes. Happy birthday. One quick thing about this is that when uh, she was first called up to do this movie, she assumed it was naturally a cameo. And I saw an interview where she said to Stephen, um, look, I'm not anyone to tell you how to make your movie, but I don't do cameos. Um, <laughs> which is good for her. That is not something she wants yeah, to do. Yeah, for sure, yeah. And she didn't demand anything. She's just like, this is not something I'm interested in doing, if that's what you're offering. But it turns out that's not what they were offering. What they offered was what she got to do here, which was an actual role in the story. No, she has a good role. She's in it quite a bit. She's in a few of the numbers. She has her right. own song. I almost wish they no, did this good. with Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins Returns. Right. Because Dick Van Dyke comes like uh, in one scene and that's when the movie comes to life. <laughs> it's it's the best fucking scene of the movie. It's like two minutes long. If that Oh my god. Yeah, right? Oh that's so funny. Um 
Yeah, no, it's... By the way, Dick Van Dyke turned 96 yesterday. Holy shit. He's, he's one of the mm-hmm. good ones. Always has been. I love him. Um, I, I really... I enjoyed the hell out of this film. I really, like I said, I do think it's Spielberg's, one of his best in a long, it felt like that Spielberg magic. Like, yes, this is, this is the Spielberg I'm used to, Mm -hmm. right? Like 95 to 99% of the issues I have with this film has to do strictly with the material itself and what it is. And that's, something that just can't be changed Mm -hmm. right it it is what it is it's like going to a a rib joint but you don't like ribs do you do you give the 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 joint a bad grade no like that's that's stupid they don't go to a rib joint then (laughs) so that's kind of where i am with this film i I, again i i would readily watch it again just because there's so because I do like a lot of it. I do like a lot of the acting, a lot of the character stuff, especially in the beginning. And it's directed masterfully. It's, again, it's big, bombastic, beautiful, beautiful filmmaking that we just don't see yeah. anymore. And, again, looking at that box office, we won't see again for a long time, if ever. Unless Steven decides he wants to do more musicals. Which, I mean, he's at the point where he can make whatever movie he wants. <laughs> But it won't be with this know. money, this budget. No, not with this budget. But that's what I yeah. mean, though. If you have Steven Spielberg and fucking West Side Story, and you can't sell tickets as a musical, what musical can you sell tickets for? Beats the hell out of me. I. That's kind of where I'm at with it. It's like... It's it's Unless, like if do you ever do that Hamilton ad- adaptation? That would make money. That's true. That would make money. Although Disney might be feeling apprehensive now. They what do they lose ultimately movie. besides marketing money? I mean, they didn't really put any funding into that movie. This was Fox, which is the the corpse they they adopted. And again, it's really unfortunate how many of these late, late stage Fox films are just being re- dumped out with with Last Duel, West Side Story, and then this month Nightmare Alley mm-hmm. and The King's Man all happening at the same time. Yeah, none of them are going to make money. I'm going to watch all of them. I'm going to love all of them. Um, you know what would help musicals a lot? If you let the public see the stage play. Mm, right like with, with Hamilton for whatever for whatever reason I don't know why this isn't a thing why cuz cuz you know how like stand up specials mm-hmm. are all big on Netflix you know why it's a thing you you know why brought all Broadway shows are not available to be seen by the public because broad why because not, you said it yourself when we discussed Hamilton or in the heights that by it by design Broadway is an exclusive medium for sure, but like with stand up. I, by the way, am a proponent of it being uh-huh. exclusive. I feel that it should be loved by yeah, everybody, yeah, yeah. but I think that the people who are the masters of that particular world feel very much that this was a medium that can only ever really be cherished and enjoyed if you can afford a ticket to buy and go to that place, which most people will never be able to do. So there it is. But I, I guess my thing is like, look at stand up. Right. Just because people watch the stand-up specials at home doesn't mean they're still not willing to shell out a shit ton of money to go see their specials live, right? Because it's all about seeing it live. It's the same with, like, concert movies, uh-huh. right? Like, it's all about... It's all about growing the audience. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of these musicals would have the audiences grow of similar to netflix like there's a lot of stand-up specials it's like i don't know this comedian but let me let me right. check it out and it's like oh that's pretty funny uh oh they, they they got a show near my town next week maybe i'll check them out like that's how you grow it and i think if you want musicals as a medium to grow especially <laughs> sorry it's my cat she's killing something oh my god um 
I think the reason why Hamilton's such a big hit is because people are able to see it, right? Like, I feel like if if you you would have so many surprise breakout hits if you regularly threw uh, taped Broadway mm-hmm. musicals onto a streaming channel. A lot of them are bound to be runaway hits where everyone's like, oh my god, I chucked it out and it's cool. And then what happens? People are like, you know, uh, they're like, hurry, like let, let's make an official movie now, mm-hmm. right? And, and and then what happens is you have a built-in base that's now excited to see the movie. I don't know. I, I just, I feel Was like... Was Cats ever released on home video? Why not? You know what? It was... As like a VHS, right? I think like back in uh-huh. the 90s. But maybe that was just too long ago. It's too, too long ago. They did not strike while the no, iron was No, they strike when the I'll iron was way. like bombed by, I don't know, some kind of airplane. There was nothing <laughs> left of it. No. And then, of course, the movie yeah. was the movie. Which, I mean, maybe to be fair, even if the film was like competent, First of all, I wouldn't like it as much because I love <laughs> the disaster that it was, honestly. Like, it's... No, I, the only thing missing was the butthole. <laughs> that was it. But even if it were, like, let's say, competently made um, and maybe, it, like, serious, which I don't know how, really, <laughs> that could have happened. But if it was, <laughs> it pop- the box office would have been more or less the same. Let's be real. Maybe. But it may be if the original uh what's it called Re- tape. Was like it resurfaced or it was put on streaming somewhere put on streaming and where people would like regularly it became right. a thing you know where people would watch it and you know even if not huge but a certain level of nostalgia with everyday people to it I for sure I think he would have gotten a bigger like box Disney office. can do this. I because... don't know why they don't on Disney Plus, but there are state there are the Broadway musicals of Lion King and and Aladdin and Little Mermaid, but I don't think they're on Disney Plus. Why? I don't know. No. Well, it's like Cats is a household name, but no one at least before the movie came out could tell you a fucking thing about the musical. Isn't that hilarious? I, I, it's I've the most known... successful musical of all time, but nobody understands what it is <laughs> like i knew my whole life about the, the musical right. cats and i never until i saw the movie could never tell you a single i i don't know what the fuck it is i don't right. know what it's about and that's the same with a lot of other people they're like yeah i've heard of cats but i don't know what uh-huh. it is I, i've never been to new york i've never seen a show like i don't i don't right. fucking know and that's most people so yeah so even though it's a brand name recognition, you could say when they greenlit the film, just because people know what it is doesn't mean they're clamoring to go see it, uh-huh. if you know what I mean. Uh, but yeah, that, that's that's my two cents. If you want to bring back the musical and movie theaters, bring them to the small screen first and those taped releases. Forgot to mention, I guess another musical this year was Serrano. Whenever that that's going to be a limited release, I feel. That's the, right. The Peter Dinklage the, movie. The, yeah. God damn. So many yeah. in one year. I'll mm-hmm. watch that one. All right. Well, I think we're about done here. Um, this, all I'll say is that, and I feel like... Um, not to retread thing, but this this film really did bring me such joy. Um, I've had it's kind of having a rough two weeks there, you know, post surgery and everything. Just the whole thing kind of really threw my groove off with like the whole Christmas cheer and all the season and everything. And I think this this really did bring me back to like life in a way. Uh, I love this this music and I love this movie and um. I'm just uh, happy I'm not alone in that because usually when it comes to a Spielberg film, I kind of feel a little bit alone when it comes to like how much I love it. But it's nice to have the company this time around. And I'm 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 curious to see what Moreno, <laughs> the Morenos and Kyle think of this if they ever see it. And I think they would because I know that they were interested at some point to see this movie. So yeah, they should definitely see it. Yeah, I'd be very interested to what the to reaction see it. would be. Mm-hmm. 
because Kyle does love they musicals. They all love musicals, or at least he can. Alexis in particular, she loves Broadway musicals. I think she. I think she's the yeah, aficionado sure. of the group. <laughs> you got. Oh no, you weren't there. They made me Newsies. watch uh, Paper Newsies, Boys. Yeah. Newsies. And again, that's one where I guess that's backwards, though, right? Because they had the movie first and then the play. Mike Feist was in the uh, movie, by the way, who played uh, Riff in this movie, in the Newsies. <laughs> That's where I saw him from. Oh, now you recognize him. <laughs> he looked familiar. Okay, it's all coming together. I was like, yes. Okay, I know who. Okay, okay. But yeah, I saw the newsies at like two in the morning with them. Which is it's <laughs> it was. Uh, I guess this is par for the course <laughs> for musicals. It was not what I thought it was. <laughs> It was literally about starting a union. <laughs> the The story is literally about Paperboy starting uh-huh. a union, which I was like, I, I mean, I solidarity, I guess, sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was like, I, I, I just didn't expect that 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 was what the story was. Um, yeah. well, guys, it's basically three hours, and that means it's time for us to go. It it without fail. <laughs> I I really do blame you. I 100% we blame We didn't you. even do what we saw this week. And we still... I... Anyway, thank you all for listening so much. We we don't... We, we so hope that you enjoy... We... I'm dead. I'm tired. I just want to see Hawkeye. Okay. I so hope you've enjoyed our discussion. And I also hope that you venture out and go see both of these films. Very, very good. They are being discussed as among the best of the year, and they are among my favorite films of the year. And yeah, stay tuned for more content next time. It's Spider Man. I I don't know. It'd be funny if Peter walks out saying this was great. I mean, With the way things have gone way- lately. This has been going. That's very much a possibility. I mean, you like Ghostbusters Afterlife. I- I enjoyed it. I didn't say it was like a fucking I, great. Oh, okay. Area. I thought you legitimately liked it. I said there was good things in it, and I had a good. We'll just time. say the review speaks for itself. We'll it was it was dense. <laughs> there was a lot going on. <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening. Catch us back next week for No Way Home. Standard or spotlight, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Mm-hmm.